can have everybody move to the center so that the empty seats end up on the aisles because there's people that are coming in and want seats and they are enforcing the fire code. So that means if there's no seats and people start sitting in the aisles, they'll, ask, they'll be asked to leave. Okay? Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. May God's peace, blessings, and His mercy be upon you all this evening. On behalf of the Muslim Students Association, Campus Crusade for Christ, and College Life Christian Fellowship, I would like to welcome you all to tonight's debate. Tonight's debate will focus on the Prophet of Muhammad, peace be upon him, in the light of Islamic and Christian views. I understand that the word debate implies winning and losing. But let's not make tonight about that. Let's use this debate as an avenue where we can better understand each other. Understand that a debate of such nature shall perhaps tell us more about our differences than similarities. But remember, Muslims and Christians alike have a lot and a lot in common. Understand that we already come here with our biases. And this debate tonight isn't for the faint of heart. It's for people who can listen. People who can listen with open minds and open hearts. It's for people who are willing to change the way they think. You know, think with an open box. Think outside the box. You know, we're here at UC Davis. We're critical thinkers. So, you know, listen to other people's opinions and views. Refrain from making any comments, any applause, and any agreements or disagreements with the speakers till this debate is over. In light of what happened during our last debate, most of you were there, we had some ruckus, we had some, some disturbances. So this time around, we do have security. <laughs> That's just the sad reality of the situation. I've been told that we, had, we were going to have three cameras, but as you can see, we have four or five or six of them today. <laughs> so if you do create any disturbance, any ruckus, any intolerance, <laughs> You will be escorted outside, and we will inform student judicial affairs. So that's the big threat for today. <laughs> so let's please conduct ourselves with discipline, patience, and dignity. The same discipline, the same patience, the same dignity that's been preached to us by Adam, Abraham, Moses, Jesus Christ, and Muhammad. Peace be upon them all. With that, I'd like to introduce today's speakers. We have Ali Atai representing the Muslims today. And we have David Wood representing the Christians tonight. A Thai, I quote, is the founder and president of the Muslim Interfaith Council, an organization dedicated to spreading and defending the truth of Islam in America. He received a Bachelor's of Science degree in accounting from Cal Poly San Luis Obispo. Since graduating in 2000, A Thai has been both a visiting assistant instructor of religious studies at Cal Poly, as well as author of books entitled, In Defense of Islam, Confronting Christians with their own scriptures and in Jiu Haq, the true gospel of Jesus Christ. Wood, I quote, is a former atheist who converted to Christianity because of the historical evidence for the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I quote, Wood has earned degrees in biology and philosophy. He is currently pursuing a PhD in philosophy of religion and is a member of the Society of Christian Philosophers. Our two speakers already know, but I'd like to remind you people about today's format. It has been decided that David Woods will be opening today's debate. He'll be speaking for 30 minutes. This will be followed by Elliot Tai coming to the stage, and he'll be speaking for another 30 minutes. This will be followed by a 15-minute rebuttal from Mr. Woods, followed by which we'll have Elliot Tai once again take the podium, and he'll have 15 minutes for his rebuttal. This time around, in order to spice things up a little bit, I don't know if you would like it or not, but the audience this time around does not have an opportunity to ask questions. What's going to happen instead is the two speakers can ask each other five different questions. They'll have a max of three minutes each for each response. After this session, Q&A session, David was going to come up to the stage and give his conclusion in five minutes. This will be followed by another conclusion from Ali Atai. And that's, that's how tonight's going to be. Once again, I remind you, you know, be very patient today, be disciplined. Come here with dignity, respect each other around you, and you know, open up your minds. Look at things from a different perspective. We're students here, and there are educators amongst us. You know, this is a great university. You know, let's take something you know, with us when we go back. Thanks. Thank you for your time. <laughs>
Well, good evening. I'd like to thank the Muslim Student Association and College Life and Campus Crusade for Christ for sponsoring the debate tonight. And I'll just say that I think it's great that out here in Davis, California, Muslims can get together with a Christian group that has crusade as part of its name and uh, everyone gets along. That's, uh, that's some good stuff. It may have taken us a thousand years, but we're all here and, uh, and that's what counts. I'd also like to thank Ali for his willingness to debate such a sensitive issue. I have always been impressed by people who are willing to lay their beliefs on the table and say, go ahead, take your best shot. And Ali is one of those people. In fact, Ali is the one who chose our topic tonight. He was ready to put his faith in Muhammad to the test in public. And that sort of confidence is admirable. I do want to warn everyone here uh, again that uh, this is not going to be pretty. Uh, we're not here for an interfaith picnic. Interfaith picnics are great, but this is a debate. We're not here to affirm one another's faiths. I'm saying that Ali is wrong about Muhammad, and he's saying that I'm wrong about Muhammad. I'm pointing this out because uh, for many Christians and Muslims, um, our beliefs are the most important thing in the world. And when people start saying our beliefs are false, wow. To be honest, I'd rather have someone say something I don't like about my wife or mother than about King Jesus. But at the same time, uh, I recognize that people disagree with me and that it's important to understand their reasons for disagreeing with me. Um, now, if you're here tonight, I assume that like me and like Ali, you are prepared to have your beliefs challenged and criticized. And Ali and I will certainly do our best to challenge you this evening. Just to give you a little background as to where I'm coming from, I converted from atheism to Christianity when I was 20 years old. I was trying to prove that Christianity is false by refuting the resurrection. Um, I came up with some theories to explain away the evidence, but in the end I looked at my theories and said, you know, this just doesn't fit the facts. So I had a decision to make. I could either ignore the facts and go on with my life as an atheist, or I could surrender to Jesus Christ as Lord. It was the most difficult decision I've ever had to make, but I decided to submit to God and to give my life to Jesus Christ. About a year or two later, I met a convert to Islam named Anthony. Anthony and I became uh, weightlifting partners, and as we lifted weights, we would debate Islam versus Christianity. So there was testosterone all over the place. <laughs> but, uh, but Anthony and I didn't remain friends for very long because we were both so eager to win the argument that we ended up getting pretty nasty at times. And we, we eventually got to the point where we weren't even presenting evidence anymore. We were just making fun of each other's religions. And, and that was both our faults. We were young. But uh, I've always regretted that because for a while we were good friends. Later, as I was studying philosophy as an undergrad, I focused on religious studies and I studied Islam as part of my coursework. We had to read modern works on uh, Islam from people like the Islamic scholar John Esposito. And when I read those modern sources and I listened to the lectures of my Muslim professor, Muhammad sounded like a pretty good guy. In fact, I once wrote a paper on what an amazing job Muhammad did in Arabia. I even gave a speech on that topic at two different universities. But while I was in college, I met a man named Nabil Qureshi. One night we ended up sharing a hotel room uh, during a school trip. That first night, before we went to sleep, I was reading my Bible, and Nabil was putting away his clothes. And all of a sudden he said, So, are you a hardcore Christian? <laughs> and I said, Yes, and it was on. And it was fun, too, because Nabil is one of the smartest people I've ever met. Later that weekend, we stayed up all night debating. In the middle of it all, I stopped Nabil and I said, look, I know what you believe. But if what you believe is wrong, if what you've been taught all your life is false, do you really want to know it? And he said yes and no. He said yes, because I want to know the truth about God. And no, because leaving Islam would destroy my life. But then he said that his desire for truth outweighs his desire for comfort in this world. Nabil and I became best friends, and we still are. But we spent four years of our lives arguing with one another. We discussed Jesus and Muhammad, the Bible and the Quran, the Trinity and Tawhid. We went to scholarly sources, we watched debates, we talked to scholars, we read books. We wrote down our arguments so that other people could examine them. And it was in the course of that dialogue that I was able to weigh the evidence for Islam and to examine my reasons for rejecting Muhammad as a prophet. So the case that I present to you this evening is something that came out of a careful dialogue between best friends. 
Tonight I'll just be able to summarize why I don't believe in Muhammad. That's, that's the downside of public debates. There's never enough time to cover everything. But we should be able to cover quite a bit. Just to give you a quick outline, I'm going to begin by talking briefly about why Christians are pretty suspicious when it comes to Muhammad. The debate tonight isn't about Christianity. We're focusing on Muhammad. But there are a lot of Christians here, and so uh, I'd like to take a few minutes um, explaining why Christians disagree with Muslims on this crucial issue. Um, after that, I'll uh, discuss two popular arguments for Islam, and I'll try to explain why these arguments don't work. And finally, I'll address the reliability of Muhammad in terms of certain details of his life that many people find objectionable. So first, why don't Christians believe that Muhammad was a prophet? Well, the most obvious answer would be that Christians believe the gospel. And the heart of the gospel according to the New Testament is, it consists of three things. The divine Son of God died on the cross for sins and rose from the dead. So, Son of God, death on a cross, resurrection. Those are the three key elements of the gospel according to the New Testament. But we're also told in the New Testament that false prophets would come and that they would try to change the gospel. <coughs> Nearly six centuries later, Muhammad came along and he said, you Christians believe in God? Me too. You believe Jesus was born of a virgin? Me too. You believe Jesus was the Messiah? Me too. But there are just three things I'd like to change. One, Jesus wasn't the Son of God. Two, he didn't die on the cross. And three, he didn't rise from the dead. Now, when a Christian hears that, an alarm goes off. Hey, wait a minute. Those are the three most important things. He's changing the gospel, just like Jesus and the apostles said. Now, those of you who are Muslims would say, Muhammad didn't change the gospel. Muhammad restored the gospel. Christians changed the words of Jesus. Muhammad just fixed all the errors that Christians added over the centuries. But here we find a problem. You see, when Muhammad preached in Arabia, there weren't a lot of historians around. People didn't have many writings from the first and second century. What this means is that Muhammad could pretty much say whatever he wanted to say about Jesus, and no one could prove him wrong. So Muhammad could say, as he does in Surah 4, 157, that Jesus was not killed, nor was he crucified. Muhammad was free to say that Jesus claimed to be nothing but a prophet, and that Jesus' disciples were Muslims. No one in Muhammad's time could really show that these claims were false. But the world has changed. In addition to the biblical record, we now have writings by the Jewish historian Josephus and the Roman historian Tacitus. We have writings by Mara Bar Serapion and Lucian of Samosata. We have uh, the Jewish Talmud and the works of the early church fathers. We have an unbroken chain of testimony going back to Jesus' followers. And of course, we have the historical method and tools for textual criticism. So now we have the ability to test whether Muhammad's claims about Jesus line up with history. And when we apply the tools of textual criticism and the historical method to the ancient documents, we find that the Muslim view of Jesus as a man who claimed to be uh, nothing but a prophet, who was never killed, who was never rose from the dead, and whose followers were Muslims, this view of Jesus just doesn't line up with the historical evidence. So this would be my first criticism of Muhammad. We can test certain things he said, and when we do, we find that the evidence just doesn't support some of his claims. But I think the situation gets worse when uh, Muslims try to reconcile history with the teachings of Muhammad. Uh, for instance, consider Muhammad's claim that Jesus wasn't killed and wasn't crucified. History shows that everyone in the first century was convinced that Jesus died by crucifixion. So how do Muslims respond? Well, the most common answer I hear is that God took Jesus to himself and disguised Judas to make him look like Jesus. Then Judas was crucified, but God made everyone think that it was Jesus. Now, when I hear explanations like that, all I can think is, that's your story? All of the available evidence tells us that Jesus died because God did such a great job tricking everyone? God must have done a great job indeed because even Jesus' followers believed that he died on the cross. Think about that for a moment. Where did Christians get the idea that Jesus died on the cross? Well, if the most common Muslim explanation is correct, we apparently got this false idea from God. So God accidentally started Christianity when he tricked everyone into believing that Jesus died. 
Now, explanations like this are hard to accept if you're not a Muslim. But Muslims are really forced into making these sorts of claims because Muhammad said things that just don't line up with the historical evidence. And as we proceed through tonight's debate, you'll come to see more and more what a huge problem history is for Islam. But I think a Muslim could respond to some of this by saying, yes, we do have to reinterpret some of the historical data so that it fits our beliefs. But we have a good reason for doing so. We know that Muhammad was a prophet. And since Muhammad was a prophet, we can trust what he says about Jesus. And actually, I would, I would agree with that reasoning to some extent. If we had good evidence for the prophethood of Muhammad, then we would have a good reason for reinterpreting certain things based on his words. But does the evidence show that Muhammad was a prophet? Um, <clears throat> let's change gears here and take a look at two common Muslim arguments. First, Muslims argue that Muhammad's miraculous scientific insights are proof that his message was from God. Muslim <coughs> apologists um, point to certain claims in the Quran and the Hadith. They give these claims a scientific interpretation and then they ask, how could Muhammad have known this? Now, based on the examples I've examined, I can say that I've never seen anything that looks like a miraculous scientific insight in either the Quran or the Hadith, though I'm sure that Ali has some interesting things to share with us. But apart from this, there's a tremendous problem with this argument. What do you do with all the scientific inaccuracies in the Quran and the Hadith? I'll give you a few examples. In Sahih al-Bukhari, Muhammad tells his followers, if a fly falls into your drink, dunk the fly in the drink. Because one of the fly's wings has a disease, but the other wing has the cure for the disease. Is that scientifically correct? No. Flies don't spread cures for diseases on their wings. According to both Sahih al-Bukhari and Sahih Muslim, Muhammad told his followers that Adam was 90 feet tall and that people had been shrinking since the time of Adam. Is that true? No. It's physically impossible for a human being to be anywhere near that tall. So we read things like that in the Hadith, but what about the Quran? Well, Surah 1886 tells us that Alexander the Great traveled so far west, he found the place where the sun sets. According to the Quran, the sun sets in a pool of murky water. Do you know what stars are, according to the Quran? Surah 67.5 and the Hadith tell us that stars are missiles that God uses to shoot demons when they try to sneak into heaven. In Surah 27, ants talk to Solomon. In Surah 86, we learn that sperm are produced between the ribs and the spine. And according to several verses in the Quran, humans come from a clot of blood. All of these claims are scientifically false. Now, can Muslims reinterpret them? Yes. Um, and they do. But why should non-Muslims reinterpret these passages? In other words, the argument from scientific accuracy is circular. We have to assume from the beginning that Muhammad was a prophet, so that when we get to the scientific errors, we can reinterpret them based on our belief that Muhammad was a prophet. Then, once we've reinterpreted Muhammad's claims to bring them in line with modern science, we can ask ourselves, how did Muhammad get all of this right? He must be a prophet. But that's what we had to assume at the beginning. And that's just circular. Second, Muhammad's argument for Islam was not a scientific argument. I'm not really sure what it is. I might call it an argument from literary excellence or something to that effect. But it's more of a challenge than an argument. We find the challenge in several places in the Quran. Surah 223 says, If you are in doubt as to that which we have revealed to our servant, then produce a chapter like it. And call on your witnesses besides Allah, if you are truthful. Um, so the, the, the claim is, is pretty simple. If you want to prove that the Quran is not the word of God, just try to produce something like it. Um, in case you've never heard a chapter of the Quran, I'll give you an example. Here's Surah 105. Have you not considered how your Lord dealt with the possessors of the elephant? Did he not cause their war to win in confusion and send down to prey upon them birds and flocks, casting against them stones of baked clay so he rendered them like straw eaten up? That's a surah. It's one of the short ones, some are much longer. But uh, the question is, are the words I just recited so amazing that they could only come from God? Now obviously not. So at this point Muslims usually say, well, it only works in Arabic. But I think this only adds another problem to an already weak argument. Here's why. There are nearly 7,000 known languages in the world. The evidence for God's existence works in any one of them. Look at the world. Look at life. Search your heart. God exists. 
The evidence for Christianity works in any language. Jesus rose from the dead, so listen to him. But all of a sudden we get to the Quran and we get an argument that can only be examined if you're lucky enough to speak Arabic. Fortunately, however, those of us who are linguistically disadvantaged can investigate this claim because we can go to history and we can see how people who speak Arabic but aren't Muslims have answered this challenge historically. And when we do this, we find that Muhammad's challenge has been met over and over and over again for nearly 14 centuries. Now, those of you who are Muslims uh, are thinking, no, the challenge is always, no one's been, ever been able to meet the challenge. Um, but according to who? To Muslims? Uh, this isn't a challenge for Muslims. This is a challenge for unbelievers. Supposedly, when a person tries to write something like a chapter of the Quran, he'll realize that it just can't be done, and he'll feel ashamed. But that's not what happens. And we know this from early Muslim sources. In the early Muslim records, we read about a man named Al-Nadir. When Muhammad was preaching in Mecca, Al-Nadir used to follow him around. And when Muhammad would recite a passage from the Quran, Al-Nadir would say, I can tell a better story than that. And then he would recite some verses. And he would ask the listeners and say, in what way is Muhammad's story better than mine? What was he doing? He was doing exactly what the Quran says unbelievers can't do. And later, when Muhammad was more powerful, Al-Nadir was captured by Muslims and executed. Apparently, that was all they could do in response to his verses. Now, as far as I can tell, these are the two strongest arguments for the Prophet of Muhammad, the scientific argument and the argument from literary excellence. If Ali knows some better ones, I hope he'll share them. In the meantime, I would say that we don't have any good reasons for believing that Muhammad was a prophet. But it gets worse, because not only is there no good evidence for the prophethood of Muhammad, there's also good evidence against the prophethood of Muhammad. Let's turn now to the reliability of the prophet of Islam. As I said earlier, when I was an undergrad studying modern works on Muhammad, I thought that he was a pretty amazing person. But while I was studying Islam with my friend Nabil, I did something that changed my opinion of Muhammad quite a bit. Instead of reading books written in the 20th century, I started reading the early Muslim sources. Ibn Ishaq, Sahih al-Bukhari, Sahih Muslim, Al-Tabari. I was pretty surprised at what I found. I'll share a few of the issues that bother me. First, there's the question of Muhammad's spiritual reliability. Pastor Jerry Vines is famous for saying that Muhammad was demon-possessed. I'll go on record as saying, one, that I don't think the evidence proves that conclusion, and two, that we should probably be more careful when we make claims of that nature. But at the same time, there are some troubling passages in the early Muslim literature. And I think that a debate is the place to examine them so that people can hear both sides of the story. Now, we know from Muslim records that when Muhammad began receiving his revelations, his first impression was that he was demon-possessed. We also know that uh, after he left the cave, he tr became suicidal and tried to hurl himself off a cliff. We know that it was his wife Khadija and her cousin Baraka who persuaded him that he wasn't possessed, he was a prophet of God. Now, what happened to Muhammad in that cave when the Quran started coming to him? I don't know. But I know this, when Muhammad ran out of that cave, terrified, depressed, and suicidal, he was convinced that he had seen a demon, and that's a problem. But it's not the only problem. Think about the satanic verses. The verses that Muhammad re revealed to his followers and later claimed were from Satan. Here's what happened. When Muhammad was preaching in Mecca, he didn't win very many followers. But he wanted his countrymen to convert to Islam. And he was hoping to receive a revelation that would help them. Then one day he got the revelation he was looking for. It said, have you not heard of Alat and Alusa and Manat the third, the other? These are the exalted cranes whose intercession is to be hoped for. That's what Surah 53 originally said. It said that in addition to Allah, there are three goddesses that Muslims can pray to, Alat, Alusa, and Manat. Muhammad delivered these revelations to his followers. He bowed down in honor of them, and then his followers bowed down with him. But a little later, Muhammad came back and said, that these verses, which he had delivered as part of the Quran, 
weren't really from God. They were from Satan. So when you read Surah 53, keep in mind the fact that it originally promoted polytheism and that Muhammad couldn't tell the difference between a revelation from God and a revelation from Satan. Those are problems. It's also interest, interesting to note that at one point late in life, Muhammad was the victim of a magic spell that lasted about a year. According to several passages in al-Bukhari, one of the Jews stole Muhammad's hairbrush and used it to cast a spell on him. Ibn Ishaq tells us that Muhammad was bewitched during this time, and al-Bukhari adds that the spell made him delusional. So according to Muslim sources, God's greatest prophet was under a spell for a year. And so we look at the historical records and we find, one, that Muhammad originally thought that he was demon-possessed, two, that he became suicidal when he started receiving his revelations, three, that he delivered verses from Satan, and four, that people could cast spells on him. Muslims look at all of this and say, no big deal. I look at it and say, maybe there's something wrong here. Second, Muslims claim fairly regularly that Muhammad was a man of peace. I have absolutely no clue what sources they're reading when they say this. The early Muslim records are filled with acts of extreme brutality by Muhammad and his followers. Assassinations, executions, beheadings, torture. We find, people, we find Muhammad ordering people to uh, assassinate people for writing poetry against Islam. We find Muhammad ordering, his um, ordering people to assassinate people for insulting him. I'll give you a few examples. Kaab bin al-Ashraf was a Jewish merchant. He never physically attacked Muhammad or his followers, but he did write some pretty harsh poetry. So one day Muhammad ordered his men to assassinate Kaab, and they did. They cut him from his stomach down to his groin over poetry. According to Muslim sources, a man named Abu Afak, who was more than a hundred years old, wrote a poem criticizing the Muslims. Muhammad said, who will deal with this rascal for me? Salim agreed to do it. He waited until Abu Afak was asleep, and he stabbed him through the liver over poetry. When a woman named Asma heard that Muhammad had murdered an old man for writing a poem, she wrote a poem in retaliation. She called on people around her to stand up to Muhammad. When Muhammad heard about it, he said, who will rid me of Marwan's daughter? Umair agreed to do it. He went into her room, found her with her five children, one of whom she was breastfeeding, and he stabbed her to death over poetry. When one of Muhammad's followers heard a man say that he would never accept Islam, the Muslim took a bow and drove it through the man's eyeball, through his brain, and out the back of his head. Muhammad blessed his follower for his dedication. Muhammad once told his men to execute a slave girl who wrote a song making fun of him, and they did. A man named al Huwairith was executed for insulting Muhammad. A woman named Sarah was trampled to death by a horse for insulting Muhammad. One day after conquering a city, Muhammad ordered his followers to torture a man named Kanana because he was hiding money and the Muslims wanted it. Muhammad told them to light a fire on Kanana's chest until he told them where the money was. Then they cut off his head. As Muslims in the room know, the Quran allows men to have sex with their slave girls and female captives, those whom your right hands possess. To give you an example of how this practice was carried out, when the Muslims conquered Banu al-Mustalik, Muhammad allowed his men to have sex with the women they captured, even though these women were about to be sold into slavery. It's also important to note that the families of these women had just been slaughtered by Muslims, and yet it was perfectly acceptable for Muslims to have sex with these grieving women who were about to become slaves. Now that's just a sample of the details we find in the early Muslim literature. There much, there's much more we could talk about. Muhammad winning converts by robbing caravans. Muhammad beheading hundreds of Jews who tried to defend themselves when they realized they were being eliminated, and so on. But you get the picture. Third, let's talk about Muhammad's wives. Surah 4.3 says that Muslims can marry up to four women. But we know from history that Muhammad had a lot more than four wives. So why did Muhammad get more? Al-Tabari Al puts the number at 15. Um, we know from references in, in Al-Bukhari that Muhammad had at least nine wives at one time. So why did Muhammad get more? The answer is found in Surah 3350, which says that Muhammad, and only Muhammad, could have as many wives as he wanted. So the Quran lays down a rule for Muslims, saying they can have up to four wives, 
But Muhammad receives another revelation, giving him and him alone special moral privileges, namely lots of women. If you believe in the Quran, there's no problem here. God just wanted Muhammad to have more wives than his followers could have. But for those of us who aren't Muslims, I have to say this looks awfully suspicious when a prophet receives revelations and those revelations give him more sexual partners than other people. Another concern I'll point out here is Muhammad's relationship with Aisha. It's a historical fact that Muhammad had sex with his nine-year-old wife, Aisha. The question is, what do we do with it? Now, I think that we do need to understand that this was a different culture and a different time and that we need to consider this when we, when we try to make judgments. But at the same time, Muhammad is supposed to be the greatest man who's ever lived, an example for all mankind for all time. And I think that many people in this room would agree with me when I say that history's greatest man probably shouldn't be having sex with a girl who, according to Muslim records, was still playing with dolls. Now, please don't misunderstand me when I raise these criticisms. I'm not trying to convey the idea that Muhammad was a completely horrible person. I don't think he was. Muhammad had many good qualities. He was dedicated to prayer, to fasting, to helping orphans. He was courageous. And there were times when he was merciful. But this doesn't make him a prophet. And when we go to history and we try to let history give us a more complete picture of Muhammad, we find that the prophet, the amazing prophet we hear about from Muslims today is very different from the man who lived in Arabia 14 centuries ago. So how do Muslims respond to these historical criticisms? Well, there are two basic approaches. First, some Muslims simply reject anything they don't like. If they find an embarrassing story in the early sources, they throw it out and pretend it never happened. Some Muslims have made an art form out of rejecting material from our earliest records of the life of Muhammad. If you're wondering why Muslims would want to throw out historical material about Muhammad, the reason is simple. When we go to the earliest sources, we find things like the satanic verses, assassinations. And some Muslims don't want to deal with this, and so it's easier to sweep all of this under the rug. Unfortunately for Ali, everything I've said so far is very well attested historically. So he's got some explaining to do. Second, when people criticize Muhammad, the most common approach I see among Muslims is to say, well, other religions have problems too, as if this makes Muhammad's problems go away. For instance, if you ask a Muslim about Muhammad's relationship with Aisha, he'll probably say, well, in the Bible, Mary may have been young when she was married to Joseph. Or if you bring up Muhammad's assassinations, you'll hear, well, there's violence in the Old Testament too. But I have to say that these aren't answers. In fact, in logic, this approach is considered a fallacy. It's called the two quoque. The two quoque works like this. Suppose you catch me lying. And you say, David, you just told a lie. And I say, well, you've lied too. You see the problem? Even if it's true that you've lied, it wouldn't change the fact that I lied. And so that's why this is a fallacy. Similarly, if the historical records tell us that Muhammad ordered his followers to torture a man for money, Muslims can't simply say, ah, but there are bad things in the Bible. That's not an answer. It's true that there are some tough, tough, tough passages in the Bible. And Christians need to be able to give answers for these passages. But uh, the point remains, we're not here to talk about Christianity. We're here to talk about Muhammad. We're here to see whether Muslims can show that the things they say about their prophet are true. Now, what I'd like to know from Ali is, how does Islam respond to these issues? Without committing the two quoque fallacy, without denying the evidence, how does Islam answer the objections I've raised? That's the question tonight. But I'll confess here as I close, that in my experience, I found that Muslims don't have any real answers for the problems I've raised. I learned this while I was debating my friend Nabil. Nabil uh, looked at these criticisms, and he traveled the world looking for answers. He couldn't find any. In the end, he poured out his heart before God, and God gave him guidance. Less than two years ago, Nabil became my brother in Christ. And by the way, Ali, Nabil says he would love to debate you. <laughs> Uh, that's the impact a careful investigation of the evidence can have on a person. Now, Ali is familiar with just about all of the criticisms I've raised, and he's had plenty of time to prepare. 
So we can expect to hear the best answers Islam has to offer. I, I haven't kept this in a closet. He knows what I was going to say. And I'm certainly looking forward to his response. Please refrain from any applause. I understand it's kind of natural for us to clap our hands after speak of these, but you know, the carousel of oh. some discipline. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's not me, it's them. <laughs> I'll leave you on the floor for 30 minutes. Assalamu alaikum. I bear witness that Muhammad, the son of Abdullah of Arabia, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, peace and blessings of God be upon him, is the messenger of God. The God of Abraham, not the moon God or the Arab God, or the God of the Middle East, no, the Lord of the heavens and the earth, Adonai Elohim, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, prostrated himself on the Mount of Olives and worshipped God, that is the same God, we believe, who sent Muhammad, peace be upon him, six centuries later. I believe the Prophet was who he claimed to be. He said, Ana Sayyidul Bani Adam, Wala Fakhri, I am the master of the children of Adam, and I do not boast. He said, Ana Khayr al I am the best of creation. I bear witness that Muhammad, the son of Abdullah of Arabia, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, peace and blessings of God be upon him, is the messenger of God. The God of Abraham, not the moon God, or the Arab God, or the God of the Middle East. No, the Lord of the heavens and the earth. Adonai Elohim, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, prostrated himself on the Mount of Olives and worshipped God, that is the same God, we believe, who sent Muhammad, peace be upon him, six centuries later. I believe the Prophet was who he claimed to be. He said, Ana Sayyidul Bani Adam, Wala Fakhri. I am the master of the children of Adam, and I do not boast. He said, Ana al I am the best of creation. We believe that he's better than the Kaaba in Mecca. He's better than the angels. He's better than the Temple of Solomon. He's better than paradise. You see, when the Prophet was preaching in Mecca, his tribe, the Quraysh, they would send messengers to the outlying borders of the city to intercept visitors, to spread lies and slanders about him. Right? And then these same people, right, they would say, oh, stay away from this man Muhammad. He's a sahir, he's a sorcerer, he's going to bewitch you. These same people would seek out the Prophet, actually listen to what he says, you know, listen to him, and they would convert to Islam on the spot. You see, they met the Prophet's enemies before they had met him. The vast majority of Americans have never really met the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. They've only heard what his enemies have said about him. And you can never rely on your enemy to give you an objective, unprejudiced disinterested account of anything. Mr. Wood's criticisms and polemics are nothing new. The Western Orientalists have vilified the Holy Prophet for hundreds of years. Montgomery Watts says, of all the world's great men, none has been so much maligned as Muhammad, end quote. Yet the Prophet's message continues to resonate in the hearts of the faithful and Islam continues to grow. How? Because God tells the Prophet in the Quran, Wallahu ya'asimuka minan nas, and God will defend and protect you from the violence and slanders of men. The Prophet's defense counsel is God himself. The skeptic like Mr. Wood cannot possibly entertain such a notion. So he concludes that Muslims must not know the so-called truth about Muhammad. No, we know the truth. It's no secret. It's no, Karen Armstrong says, we know more about Muhammad than a, about, about the founder of any other major religion. He's the only historical prophet. Now, the, only, the, the most important thing tonight is to be objective and balanced in our critical methodology. You see, the typical Christian critique of the Prophet of Islam is extremely superficial, surface level, and one-dimensional. Things are looked at purely at face value, and then the worst possible motives are ascribed to them, which in reality is only a reflection of the mental depravity of the criticizers. If a psychiatrist shows you an ink blot, and all you see is sex and violence, the problem is you. 
Summum bukmun urmyun fuhum la yaqilun. Deaf, dumb, and blind, they have no sense. But it's not your fault. I understand. You are what you read. The Bible is an anthology of sex and violence. So, you know, a man with hepatitis, he doesn't go around blaming other people because they look yellow. He has a disease in his eyes. He is the problem. He perceives the world through his own diseases. So Mr. Wood's, Mr. Wood's analysis is not surprising. This is a man, the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, who is widely regarded by many scholars of Western academia as the most influential human being to ever step foot on the earth for all of the earthly work of all of the previous prophets put together is not equal to what this one man achieved. D. Brown, a Christian missionary, says, by any standard, Muhammad's achievements were little short of miraculous. Will we just dismiss him on a superficial level? R.B. Smith says that the prophet was absolutely unique in history. That's a Christian missionary talking. His life is based on history, not mythology or conjecture. And it's not enough to say he was a great genius, he was a, a good statesman, he was a military hero. There's a lot more to this man. Alphonse de la Martin says, in the history of Turkey, quote, that is Muhammad as regards all standards by which human greatness may be measured. We may well ask, is there any man greater than he? God reminds the Prophet of this very fact in the Quran. Have we not raised high the esteem in which thou art held? Dr. William Montgomery Watt, who died last year at age 97, widely regarded as the last of the great Western Orientalists, in an interview conducted in 1999, in his 90th year, he finally conceded, quote, I believe that Muhammad, like the earlier prophets, had genuine religious experiences. As such, I believe that the Quran came from God, end quote. In his book, Muhammad at Mecca, he says, to suppose Muhammad an imposter creates more problems than it solves. And finally, Annie Basant, a non-Muslim, an author of the book, The Life and Teachings of Muhammad, concludes, it is impossible for anyone who studies the life and character of the great prophet of Arabia, who knows how he taught and how he lived, to feel anything but reverence for that mighty prophet, one of the greatest messengers of the Supreme. When the prophet was 12 years old, it was a Christian in Syria who first noticed signs of prophecy in him, Bahira the monk, when he was 40 years old. The first man to testify to his messengership was a Christian scribe, Waraka bin Nawfa. Look at the irony. Mr. Wood says in one of his uh, articles online that in the Meccan period the Prophet Muhammad was quote humble devout obedient faithful peaceful and an outstanding moral example end quote you see the vast majority of the Christian criticisms against the Holy Prophet originate from the Medinan period of the Prophet's life in other words the last nine or ten years of his life and these primarily revolve around two issues his marriages and the application of sacred law the fundamental Christian questions are, how does Muhammad, peace be upon him, go from a suffering preacher prophet in Mecca to a sword-wielding warrior in Medina? How does he go from a passively resistant monogamist to an actively resistant polygamist? The Muslim follow-up question is, did the prophet change or did the external circumstances change? You see, in Mecca, the prophet was a persecuted man, a hunted man, a man with no earthly dominion, very much like Jesus Christ in Galilee. Revelations describing societal and political laws were not yet revealed until much later in Medina. Why? Because the prophet is in no position to enforce political or societal laws in Mecca. He's just a citizen of the city. But in Medina, he was the king, the president, the sultan of the city, recognized and legitimate state authority. And it is the responsibility of the state to enforce laws and exact justice. Read Romans chapter 13. Paul says almost the same thing verbatim. So the prophet in Medina resembled Moses, which is a fulfillment of prophecy. God tells Moses in Deuteronomy 18, 18 in Hebrew, I shall raise them up a prophet from amongst their brethren, like unto thee, like you, and I shall put my words into his mouth, and he shall speak unto them all that I shall command him. All six canonical books of Hadith tell us that the Prophet never sought revenge for a personal wrong or injury. But when the laws of God and the rights of man had been breached, he was unflinching and justifiably authoritative. That was his job in Medina. He's the head of state. The Jews of Medina would seek out his judgment in their cases, in their grievances, because they knew he was the epitome of justice and generosity. The pre-Islamic Arabs gave him the title, as sadiqul Amin, the spirit of truth and trustworthiness. Martin Ling said, he was too full of truth to deceive 
and too full of wisdom to be self-deceived. We believe that the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is the apocalyptic Barnasha, the son of man of Daniel chapter 7, who reproved the world of sin, justice, and righteousness. But at the same time, and this is the greatness of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, he was meek and humble and lowly and forbearing and merciful. And his, en and his enemies used to make fun of him because of that. They used to call him effeminate. Why? Because he never raised his voice. He would weep frequently. He was compassionate and nurturing. He loved children. Once while he was kissing his grandsons, a tough uh, Bedouin chief came to him and he said, you kiss, your, you kiss your children? I have ten sons and I've never kissed a single one of them. He said, then there is nothing in my religion for those who have no compassion in their hearts. He never returned an evil for an evil. He embodied the Quranic injunction. <inaudible> Repel evil with beauty. Now, during the battle of Uhud, in the third year of the Hijrah, which is prophesied in Isaiah chapter 21, the Meccans, the unbelievers of Quraysh, they sent an army of 3,000 to pillage and plunder the city of Medina. The Prophet dispatched an army of 700 men, himself included, to defend the city. During this battle, the Prophet suffered a series of tragic events. He witnessed in front of his own eyes the slaughter of his blessed companions, the slaughter of his family members. Sayyidina Hamza, radiallahu anhu, the Prophet's uncle, and more like his brother, they were very close in age. He was killed, his body mutilated, his nose and ears cut from his body, his internal organs removed and cannibalized on the battlefield. Can I get some water? I'm sorry. Can you get Brother Tukhara. Thank you. <clears throat> the Prophet himself suffered multiple injuries to his blessed face. Blood was pouring down the face of the Messenger of God, peace be upon him. You know what he was doing? He was trying to catch the blood with his hands like this and absorb the blood with his sleeves. And then he told his companions in the vicinity, he said, if one drop of this blood should spill upon the earth, a terrible chastising punishment will immediately descend upon the Quraysh, his enemies. His companions said, O oh, Messenger of God, let the blood flow and let the punishment come. He said, I was sent as a mercy, not to curse. And then they saw him a short time later with his hands raised in supplication. Did he finally curse his enemies? You know what he said? Allahumma hdi qawmi fa innahum la ya'lamun. Oh God, guide my people, for they don't know. Even in such circumstances, he refused to curse his enemies, but only prayed for their guidance. And you know what? The leaders of the unbelievers on that day, Abu Sufyan ibn Harb, Ikrama ibn Abi Jahal, Khalid ibn al-Walid, and uh, Wahshi, the man who killed Hamza, and Hind ibn Utba, the woman who cannibalized his body, they all became Muslim within a few years. Within a few weeks, because the Prophet did not give up on them. He did not return an evil for an evil. God describes him in the Quran. Azizun alayhi ma anitum harisun alaykum. It grieves him in his very soul that you should perish or be lost. Deeply concerned is he about you. Fabima rahmatim min Allahi lintalahum. It is part of the mercy of God that you deal gently with them. He was a gentle soul. He said, Love is my foundation, reason is my guide. He said, nasi, nafsik. Love for humanity, which you would love for yourself. Not love your enemies and the Gentiles or dogs and pigs, as Matthew says. No, love humanity. He said, La hatta tu'minu, wa la tu'minu hatta tahabu. None of you will enter paradise until you truly believe. And none of you will truly believe until you love one another. Shall I tell you of something that will increase your love? They said, yes. He said, Afshu salama baynakum. Spread peace amongst yourselves. And this applies to everyone. The Prophet is the universal messenger. He's rahmatil alameen, a mercy sent unto all creation. But there are some people in the world who don't want peace. They want death and destruction. And sometimes tempered violence is necessary to create peace. In pre-Islamic Arabia, tribal warfare was the order of the day. This was the harshest environment in the world. But when there is war, we have rules of engagement. According to Sharia, according to sacred law, we cannot poison wealth. We cannot kill livestock. We cannot cut down green trees. We cannot harm the elderly. We cannot harm women and children. This is a mutawatir hadith, a multiply attested hadith, a hadith transmitted through multiple chains of narration, undeniably, undoubtedly the words of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. We do not harm women and children in warfare. We, cannot, we can't even attack people while they're sleeping. This is Islamic law. They say the Prophet was a violent man. It's just a smokescreen. It's a magic trick. Someone's trying to pull the wool over your eyes. 
Thomas Carlyle said, the lies, the well-meaning zeal heaped around this man Muhammad are disgraceful to ourselves only. And that was a Christian. I can make a similar statement. What if I said, you know, Jesus Christ advocated violence. You would say, what are you talking about? He's the prince of, he's the prince of peace. Now keep in mind, Christians believe that Jesus is the God of the Old Testament, right? Now Jesus in the Old Testament commands the Israelites under Moses and Joshua to exterminate entire populations of men, women, children, animals, and trees. Jesus inspires Moses to stone a man simply because he picked up wood on the Sabbath. Jesus reveals in the Torah that if a man rapes an unbetrothed virgin outside the city limits, the rapist must give his victim's father 50 shekels of silver and he must marry his victim. You have to marry your rapist and they're never allowed to get a divorce. Jesus in the New Testament calls for a sword and when the Pharisees criticize his disciples for not washing their hands before they ate, he criticizes them for not killing their rebellious children as the law expressly states. The penalty for filial recalcitrance is death according to the Old and New Testaments. Jesus in Luke chapter 19 after giving us the parable of the king, he concludes by saying, but those enemies who do not accept me as their king, bring them hither and slay them before me. Right? And then he leads an armed siege of the Temple of Solomon. You see, everything I just said is true. But it doesn't make my premise true that Jesus was violent. Because he wasn't. It's just a smokescreen. Right? It's rhetoric at its finest. I can do the same thing, but I'm not a spin doctor. See, the prophet ordered executions. Yes, so did our current president when he was the governor of Texas. So does Arnold the governor. So did Moses. So did David. Right? Mr. Wood relates the story of, you know, Asma bint Marwan and many other similar stories in his online writings. Almost all of these stories Mr. Wood has taken from Guillaume's translation of the Sirah of Ibn Ishaq. What he doesn't realize, however, is that most Muslim scholars, the vast majority, consider this biography of the Prophet to be only somewhat reliable at best. He wrote it over 120 years after the death of the Prophet and it is common knowledge that he took many of these stories from Jewish sources and traditions. If I borrowed a story about Jesus from the Talmud, what would you expect it to say? Yet go to any one of Mr. Wood's online writings about Islam and you notice the first footnote, Sirat Rasulullah by Ibn Ishaq, and then Ibid, 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 same as above, same as above, same as above. That's all he's got. This story is totally spurious. It's apocryphal. Where is it in the Muwatta or Kitab al -Athab? Books written by eminent scholars of Hadith that predate Ibn Ishaq. You see, Ibn Ishaq is a biographer. He's a reporter. He's not a muhaddith. He's not a scholar of hadith. He's not verifying authenticity or chains of transmission. He's relating as much material as possible. There's no sanad for this story. There's no chain of transmission. It's apocryphal. If I said that Jesus was violent as a child because he killed his schoolmates and one of his teachers, you would say, what are you talking about, you stupid Muslim? That's from, this, that's from the infancy gospel of Thomas from the second century. That's apocryphal. That's spurious. That's pseudonymous. Exactly. Again, we have to be objective in our critical methodology. Same standards apply to both religions. According to Islamic law, we can't even attack people while they're sleeping. Now, in Iraq, not too long ago, 2,000-pound bombs were dropped on civilian populations of Muslims fast asleep in their beds. In the four years since the American invasion, some have uh, surmised that 400,000 civilians have been killed in four years. How long was the Prophet Muhammad's ministry? 23 years long. If you were to count up all of the casualties and all of the battles of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, during his entire life, Muslim and enemy casualties, how many do you think you'd get? 400,000? 200,000? 50,000? 20,000? 5,000? 2,000? About 1,500. 1,500. You know, according to uh, the Bible, Exodus 32, when Moses descended Sinai, he saw his people worshiping the golden calf. He ordered the instigators killed. 3,000 men fell on one day by order of Moses. Right? 3,000, twice the number of all the people killed and all of the battles of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, during his entire 23-year ministry. And you want to call someone violent? At the conquest of Mecca, when the Prophet entered the holy city with 10,000 companions, the people of Mecca knew that he was well within his rights to punish all of them. These are the same people who had killed and tortured his family members and companions for over 20 years. But when he came into the city, he had his head down like this, in humility before God, like a servant, 
Not like these kings who bang on their drums, standing on their saddles with women orbiting around them. His head was down like this. They say his beard was touching the back of his riding beast. And then he came into the city and he said, today is a day of mercy, the exaltation of the Quraysh, a day of mercy. And then he came into the Kaaba, the shrine of Abraham. And he said, Ja al haqq wa al al batil. Truth has come and falsehood has perished. And then he climbed Mount Safa, where 20 years earlier, he was jeered and insulted and stoned. And he called everyone out of their houses where they were hiding, and out of the haram, out of the sanctuary. And they all gathered around him, thousands of them. And he stood up and he said, La tathriba alaykum al yawm, yaghfiru lahu lakum. Khalas. This day, there was no blemish upon you. God has forgiven all of you. The Prophet was magnanimous. Magnanimous. He forgave people when in a position of power. If someone's about to kill you, and you say, I forgive you, that shows a lot of character, right? Imagine someone's been trying to kill you for over 20 years and has been killing your family members and companions for over 20 years and now you're in a position to kill them, but you forgive them. That's magnanimous. So the fact that the Prophet wielded a sword to defend his people does not invalidate him as a prophet of the God of Abraham. Moses, Joshua, Isaiah, and David did the same according to the Bible. The fact that the prophet practiced polygamy does not invalidate him as a prophet of the God of Abraham. Abraham, Jacob, Moses, Solomon, who had over 700 wives, according to the Bible, did the same thing. The Jews at the time of Jesus practiced polygamy. And there isn't a single word of reproach uttered against this by Christ in the canonical Gospels. In fact, Islam did not invent polygamy. It restricted and regulated it. The prophet was not possessed. He never attempted suicide. He never raised his hand to a woman, a child, or a servant. He never allowed rape or torture or spousal abuse. He did not commit genocide upon the Jews of Medina. He did not steal his adopted son's wife. He was not immoral. And the satanic story, satanic versus story, is a straight up fabrication. And I, and I challenge anyone who says otherwise. We're just getting warmed up. I have answers for all of this stuff. <laughs> the prophet did, however, reform and eventually abolished slavery and gave women unprecedented rights even for the 20th century. Mr. Wood's presentation reminded me of the magicians of Pharaoh, right? They're trying to, you know, cast a spell over the audience to create an illusion. But then Moses showed up with the truth. Remember the Quran says, the Quran, you will hear much that will grieve you from the Jews and Christians. But you need to show patience and self-restraint. Jesus told his disciples, according to Matthew, blessed are you when men revile you and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely, falsely. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for they persecuted the prophets who came before you. So the fact that there are people in the world who love the prophet so much that they're willing to die for his cause. And at the same time, there are people in the world who love the Holy Prophet so much, that, that, that hate the Prophet so much, that they're willing to die to suppress his cause, is proof enough for me that Muhammad is a Prophet. Now, Justin Martyr, who is a second century proto-Orthodox theologian, he wrote a book called Dialogue with Trifo the Jew, in which he tries to uh, advance the legitimacy of Jesus by appealing to Old Testament prophecy. And again, we're switching gears here. We want to be balanced in our examination. So are there any prophecies of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, in the Bible? Again, according to the earliest Christian scholars, the greatest proof of legitimacy is fulfillment of prophecy. Yes, there are many prophecies, and there are so many and so succinct that God says in the Quran, يَعْرِفُونَهُ كَمَا يَعْرِفُونَ أَبْنَاهُ They know him like they know one of their own sons. Twice in the Tanakh, in the Old Testament, he's mentioned by name, by name. Song of Songs, Shira Hashirim. I mentioned this to Mike Lacona last time. He, there was no answer there. Chapter 5, verse 16. His mouth is most sweet, he is altogether lovely. Such is my beloved, and he is my friend, O ye daughters of Jerusalem. In the original Hebrew, His mouth is most sweet, he is Muhammad. This is the Arabic version of the Bible, the last part of that. Again, he's mentioned in the book of Haggai, chapter 2, verse 7, in reference to the blessed night journey and ascension of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, from Jerusalem. Once again, I shall shake the nations. Ve'yavu himda kol hagoyim. And himda of all nations shall come here. And the glory of this latter house shall be greater than the former. And in this place, I will give shalom, or salam, din de shlama in Syriac, dinul islam in Arabic. The Hebrew himda, translated most desired, 
is etymologically identical to Ahmad. And Ahmad is the superlative form of the name Muhammad, which means the most praised, the most desired, the most coveted, the most lovely, so on and so forth. Now, I'm running out of time, uh, but when I come back, I'm going to talk about, <clears throat> inshallah, God willing, the most famous Christian polemic against Islam, the marriages of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, in particular, his marriage to Ummul Mu'mineen Aisha, radiallahu anha, and we're also going to look at the biblical criteria for prophethood. But I want to mention a, a few last things here. Again, keeping in mind that according to Christianity, Jesus is the God of the Old Testament. That's an established belief. In Numbers chapter 31, Jesus tells Moses to execute all Midianite men, boys, married and divorced women, and only the young girls who have not known a man to keep alive for yourselves. Now, how do they know if a girl was a virgin or not? By raping them. This is the answer. It then states that 32,000 young girls had been discovered, discovered as not knowing men, right? And were taken and placed into the custody of the men of Israel. The exegesis of Numbers chapter 31 in the Talmud, Tana'im Midrash Sifri 157, states that girls as young as three years and one day were forcefully consummated into marriage. Three-year-old girls were raped by order of Jesus Christ. This is Christian belief, and there's no way out of it for you. There's no way out of it. You believe Jesus is God. Yes. You believe the Old Testament is the inerrant word of God. Yes. So you are stuck in this quagmire. Unless you're a Marcionite. I doubt any Christian here is a Marcionite. You believe that the God of the Old Testament was an inferior God. No, you believe that was Jesus. What's your solution? Change your theology. Does God get sent his final messenger, his holy apostle, Muhammad al-Mustafa, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, to lift you out of this quagmire? What tabi'uhu la'allakum tahdadun? If you would but follow him, that you would be guided. Now, <clears throat> I want to answer to, you know all these stories, Abu Afak, the singing girls, this and that, uh, that he brought up. None of these are based on hadith. Again, his primary source is the sirah of Ibn Ishaq. There's no hadith source for these stories. These are apocryphal stories. No Muslim takes these stories seriously. Right? Now, in his online writings, Mr. Wood also says that finding scientific inaccuracy in hadith does not invalidate the prophet as a prophet of God. That's what he says in his, in his online writings, that if there are scientific inaccuracies in the hadith, not in the Quran, in the hadith, this does not invalidate him. But today, tonight, he's quoted hadith to us. Maybe he had a, a change of heart. You know, the fly in the drink, you know, Read, uh, there's, there's long been evidence of uh, bacterial phages that develop on flies, right? I mean, there's many interpretations for these things, but this is sci I, can, I can quote the scientific journal to you, right? What else did he say? Oh, satanic verses. The prophet was possessed. Or the prophet, uh, he, uh, he uh, was suicidal, things like that. We have to, I have answers for all of this stuff. Now, I want to speak to one of them, uh, saying that the prophet was possessed by a demon. This is a very common charge amongst the prophets of God. Jesus' own family thought he was possessed by a demon. Mark chapter 3, verse 21. When they went out to lay hold of him, they said, he is insane, he is mad, he has a demon, he's majnoon. His own family thought Jesus was possessed by a demon. Now the prophet's initial, initial diagnosis was, this is true, that he might have been possessed. He's being very honest. You see, he is a sadiqul amin. He's a spirit of truth and trustworthiness. He's not huffing and puffing, coming down the mountain, saying I'm the messenger of God with his nose in the air. No, he's being very honest. He is sadiqul amin. He is honest. So he goes to his wife, and she reassures him. But she was no expert. So who do they go to? A Christian scribe. They go to a Christian scribe. And, she, and he, Nimuraka bin Nawfal, he tells him, this is the namus, which is the Arabic for the Greek nomos. The first five books, also called the uh, Pentateuch and the uh, Septuagint version of the Old Testament, is called nomos, meaning sacred law. So Waraka says, this is a sacred, this is a Christian talking, a Christian talking. Now Jesus, according to the Bible, he was, uh, he was tempted by Satan in the wilderness. And it had an effect on him. It had an effect. Uh, Satan successfully lured him to an exceedingly high mountain. Right? Ex exceedingly high. Apparently Matthew thought, you know, and showed him all the kingdoms of the world. Apparently Matthew thought that the world was flat in those days because the higher the mountain... I hate rules myself, but we've got to do this today. Mr. Wood, he has 15 minutes for his rebuttal.
Ready? At the end of my opening statement, I said that there are two basic approaches Muslims can take when Muhammad is criticized. One, they can reject early historical material, and two, they can commit what's called the two quoque fallacy. Again, the two, you commit the two quoque fallacy when instead of actually answering an objection, you say, well, you've got that problem. Um, for instance, if my wife says, David, you're mean, and I say, well, you've been mean too, uh, that's a fallacy. It's not, it doesn't answer the objection. Now, we've seen that Ali takes both of these approaches. He says uh, he rejects embarrassing material about Muhammad, and he repeatedly commits uh, the two quoque fallacy. Let me respond briefly to his comments about, uh, about the early sources. Um, Ali argues that Ibn Ishaq shouldn't be used as a historical source. I find this pretty interesting since Ibn Ishaq is our earliest detailed biography of the life of Muhammad. But let's look at Ali's reasons for rejecting it. Um, he says that it doesn't contain a reliable isnad or chain of transmission, but this is just a misunderstanding on Ali's part. The chain of transmission didn't really become important until the 9th century when uh, these theological disputes arose and uh, people like al-Bukhari and Imam Muslim wanted to go back and try and find uh, which uh, collections were reliable and so they came up with a method that you, you go for the chain of transmission. But Ibn Ishaq was written a century earlier before that became important so Ali's criticism is really that this material is so early that it arose before the chain of transmission became uh, necessary. Ali says that Ibn Ishaq incorporated material from Jewish sources. That's true, but there are four problems with this response. One, Ibn Ishaq incorporated material from Jewish sources that he considered reliable. Two, Jews know how to write history too. Three, if you want to say that Muslims shouldn't use Jewish material, you're contradicting Muhammad, who told his followers to gather reliable information from the Jews. And four, the material I'm using didn't come from Jewish sources, and so the entire objection is irrelevant. Um, Ali says that it's apocryphal. Well, I, it's not canonical. Well, I'm not interested in canonical. I'm interested in historical. And Ibn Ishaq is our earliest detailed source on Muhammad. Ali asks, how would Christians like it if he went to the, the infancy gospel of Thomas? Let's be clear here. Me going to your earliest detailed biography of Muhammad is nothing like you going to the last worst information about Jesus. Those, those, uh, those situations aren't similar. Um, let's move on to the satanic verses. Um, Ali, had, well first, Ali has painted a, a, a beautiful picture of Muhammad with, those, uh, with uh, all those references. The problem is, Ali is very selective in the details that, uh, that he shares. Some people call this the Walt Disney version of, uh, of Muhammad. And, uh, well, it's not going to work in a debate. Here's why. Uh, let's suppose I'm thinking of a man named John Gacy. Um, he entertained children at birthday parties. He held neighborhood bar barbecues regularly. He um, he, he helped people, he, helped, he worked with local charities, he worked with youth organizations like the JCs and the Boy Scouts, he helped all kinds of people, he helped young people find jobs. And I could list, I could go through and show all these wonderful things about John Gacy, but if I want to say he's a great man, I can't leave out the fact that he raped and killed 30 boys. Those things are important, and if you want the complete picture, uh, you have to go to all the details, not just the good things. If we just go to the good things, we can make anyone in the entire world look good. Um, now let's review some of the facts. The Satanic Verses, um, Ali says that uh, it's only in Ibn Ishaq and that it's a total fabrication. Let's look, at his, uh, let's look at his objections real quick. I argue that the Satanic Verses cast doubt on the reliability of Muhammad since he couldn't tell the difference between a revelation from God and a revelation from Satan. Uh, again, Ali argued that it's a forgery. Um, Ali criticizes the count because it says that there were Muslims in Abyssinia, but Ali is just wrong here. In, in the year 614 to 615, a group of 11 male Muslims and four female Muslims moved to Abyssinia to escape persecution. This is a fact of history. Ali criticizes the account. Um, he says that because it has the, the phrase, have you not heard, that uh, this can only refer to something bad, um, the object. Well, I'll quote you the Quran. Oh, my people. Have you not considered, if I have a clear proof from my Lord, have you not considered, it's the same Arabic phrase, and it says, clear proof from your Lord. Is this saying something derogatory about clear proof from God? No. And I could give you some other verses if you want. So this objection just doesn't work. Now, Ali has given his case against the satanic verses, and both of his objections are simply wrong. Um, and also the objection that I'm only getting this from Ibn Ishaq, let me give you my case for the satanic verses. Um, if you want sources, we read about the satanic verses in 1. Ibn Ishaq, 
two, Ibn Sa'd, three, Al-Tabari, four, Ibn Abi Hatim, five, Ibn Al-Mundir, six, Ibn Mardoya, seven, Musa Ibn Uqba, and eight, Abu Mashar. According to Abu Mashar, by the way, the chain of transmission does establish that this story is authentic. Ali says that the satanic verses aren't mentioned in the hadith. This is false. Sahih al-Bukhari, volume six, number 385, confirms the event. We don't get all the details, but al-Bukhari tells us that when Muhammad revealed Surah 53, all of the polytheists bowed down in honor of the revelation. Now, why would polytheists bow down in honor of Surah 53? Well, the other sources tell us. When Muhammad told people that praying to Allah, Alusa, and Manat is okay, the polytheists bowed down. That's in the sources, and it fits together perfectly. And let's not forget that a couple of verses of the Quran were a reaction to this entire incident. So uh, I think the, the satanic verses is pretty well established, and I've given eight sources plus um, confirmation in al-Bukhari, the Muslim's most trusted um, material on the life of Muhammad. So if Ali wants us to reject it, he's going to have to present a better case against it. And I've shown that his arguments so far are wrong. But what about Muhammad's other spiritual issues? I said that Muhammad's first impression of his revelations was that he was demon-possessed. Ali admits that Muhammad originally thought that he was demon-possessed. He says that this shows that Muhammad was humble. Uh, yeah, but it also shows that whatever Muhammad saw in that cave, he thought it was a demon. And how am I supposed to have complete confidence so many years later that this was really the angel Gabriel when Muhammad's first impression was that it was a demon? Um, Ali says that people thought Jesus was demon-possessed. Here we see the two quoque fallacy again, but even so, it misses the point. I'm not saying, hey, some people thought that Muhammad was demon-possessed. I'm saying that Muhammad thought Muhammad was demon-possessed, and there's a difference there. Um, I said in my opening statement that Muhammad's revelations made him depressed and suicidal. Ali says this never happened. Well, uh, it's in al-Bukhari. That's your most trusted collection. Um, it's also in Ibn Ishaq, that's our earliest biography, and in Al-Tabari, so uh, I don't have any re reason to reject this. I pointed out that Muhammad was the victim of a magic spell. The spell made Muhammad think that he had had sex with his wives when he really hadn't. Um, I don't recall an answer, but if, if you did, uh, uh, I'll get to that later. So the question of Muhammad's spiritual reliability is still a huge problem, and, and what are we supposed to make of this? Uh, Ali expects us to look at all the historical evidence and say, yes, Muhammad thought he was demon-possessed, Yes, it looks like he became suicidal according to the evidence. Yes, the evidence says he delivered revelations from Satan. Yes, people could cast spells on him, but he's still completely reliable. And I'm not willing to make that move. Next, I argued that Muhammad was not a man of peace. I pointed, one, to Muhammad's assassinations and executions, two, to his torture of Kanana, and three, to the fact that Muhammad allowed his men to have sex with their female captives, which in the modern world would qualify uh, as war crimes, even though it's in the Quran. Ali says that this is just a smokescreen. Really? Muslims tell me that Muhammad was a gentle prophet of peace. I go to your earliest sources, and it doesn't matter which sources you go to, there's plenty of material there. I go to Ibn Ishaq because it's the earliest, that's why I go there. Um, and I go there and I find uh, Muhammad ordering his followers to assassinate men and women who insulted him, who wrote poetry against him. I find people being brutally tortured. I find Muhammad telling his followers it's okay to have sex with female captives. Uh, Ali says this never happened. Well, I've got uh, four pages of references here from the Quran, from Sahih al-Bukhari, from Sahih Muslim, and from other uh, of your most reliable sources saying, yes, it did. Um, <clears throat> Ali says that Muhammad was violent because he was head of state. Uh, we need to be realistic here. Muhammad was ordering his followers to sneak into people's houses and assassinate them. Is that part of his job description? Muhammad was killing people during caravan raids. What does this have to do with being head of state? Muhammad sent assassins to Mecca. He wasn't head of state there. When Muhammad took Mecca, several people were executed for insulting him years earlier before he had any political power at all. So they weren't guilty of any crimes against the state. And what do you do with a man who was executed simply for saying that he would never become a Muslim? Um, Ali says that Muhammad was, was gentle. Uh, I'm not, that's probably the last word I'd, res, I, I'd, uh, I'd apply to Muhammad for some of these things. Um, I'll give you an example. If you don't like Ibn Ishaq, uh, here's one from uh, al-Bukhari. This is interesting because Ali claims again that Muhammad was gentle. Eight men once came to Medina. They converted to Islam, but they got sick, so Muhammad told them to go drink some camel's urine. And they did, and apparently they felt better. But then they left Islam, and they killed Muhammad's shepherd. And uh, guess what the, the peaceful, gentle prophet did when he caught these men? Now, they were guilty of murder, okay. But guess what he did? He tied them up, he had them tied up, 
He had their hands and feet cut off. He burned their eyeballs out with hot nails, and then he left them in the hot sun to die of thirst. Now, I'm willing to lay this down as a rule. If you burn out people's eyeballs with hot nails, you're not gentle. You want to know who's gentle? Mr. Rogers was gentle. Not, not, <laughs> no burning people's eyes out. Ali says, Muhammad never sought revenge. Well, you can say that. I'm going to your early sources and I see something different. Um, he says, Muhammad was just a king. His circumstances changed. Yes, he went from being in Mecca where he couldn't possibly have won a fight to going to Medina where he could win a fight. So you can't look at the Meccan period and say he was peaceful because he didn't fight. Uh, that could just mean he's smart enough to realize, hey, I better not fight because I'm going to lose. So uh, that's not very good evidence that, that he was peaceful. Next, I pointed out that Surah 4.3 tells Muslims that they can have up to four wives, um, but that Muhammad had a lot more than four wives. Uh, Ali responded to um, the issue of polygamy. I didn't criticize Muhammad for polygamy. Um, I criticized him here because he told his followers that they were allowed to have four wives and then he had more. So this was really an inconsistency and I said that it looks pretty suspicious when he received the revelation saying that he could have more. Um, uh, as far as Aisha, I brought up the issue of Muhammad's uh, uh, nine-year-old wife Aisha. I said that the greatest moral example in history probably shouldn't be having sex with a nine-year-old girl. Ali quoted the Jewish Talmud written more than 2,000 years after the Old Testament, and then once he built his argument saying, well, Jesus is the God of the Old Testament, well, the Old Testament allowed men to have sex with girls as young as three. That doesn't come from the Old Testament. Show me that one in the Old Testament. That comes from the Talmud. That was over 2,000 years later. No, no Christian in the world believes that Jesus inspired the Talmud. Um, <clears throat> as far as arguments for Islam, I argued that there's no good evidence for Islam. Ali responded to... Uh, the criticisms I drew from the Hadith, most of the ones I drew were from the Quran. Uh, yes, in my writings I do say it doesn't rule out a prophet, but I'm not using this material to rule out Muhammad as a prophet. I'm not saying he said false things. I wouldn't even, as far as I'm concerned, I don't even care if there's something in the Quran. I wouldn't rule him out as a prophet because of this. I mean, he's writing in the seventh century. I don't think all prophets had to have modern scientific views. I was using this material to respond to the Muslim scientific argument. The argument that says, we know Muhammad was a prophet because of his scientific accuracy. And I'm saying, if that's your argument, if you're making scientific accuracy the criterion for truth, then you've got a problem because you have all these passages in the Hadith and all these passages in the Quran. And I, I, I already said that you can reinterpret them. The point is, um, non-Muslims aren't going to reinterpret them. If, if, if the Quran says, uh, Alexander the Great got to the place, where the sun sets and it sets in a pool of murky water or if it says that stars are missiles that God uses to hurl at demons and when you see a shooting star it's because God hurled a, hurled a star at a demon um, when, we see, when we see things like this again you can reinterpret them but it makes it difficult to accept the argument um, I, argued, uh, I responded to the argument from literary excellence Ali didn't respond um, biblical prophecies um, he, he points out that there are uh, names and words that look like Muhammad well, uh, I mean, think about how this works. I mean, my name's David Wood. If I want, you know, think about an English Bible, I can find David and Wood all over the Bible. Um, you could find a prophecy of anyone. I mean, think, George Bush. Could you find a prophecy about... God appeared to Moses in the burning bush. This is a clear prophecy that, that God's mode of revelation to the world was through a bush. So, and who could this be? It's a clear prophecy of George Bush. Um, I don't think that's a good prophecy. Um, but actually, the entire argument... The entire argument from biblical prophecies is pretty easy to refute because Ali believes that Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 18 predicts the coming of a prophet after Moses. I agree. But by granting Deuteronomy 18, Ali has just ruined his case for biblical prophecies. Verse 18 says that God will write, raise up a prophet like Moses. Unfortunately, just two verses later we read this. But the prophet who speaks a word presumptuously in my name which I have not commanded him to speak, or which he speaks in the name of other gods, that prophet shall die. So we see two things here. One, if a prophet says something that I have not commanded him to say, or two, if he speaks in the name of other gods, he's not a prophet. Muhammad did both when he revealed the satanic verses. Ali says it never happened. I gave eight sources plus al-Bukhari as confirmation. So according to history, this really did happen. And according to this passage, which Ali grants is inspired by God, Muhammad cannot possibly 
be a prophet. And so I would say that, that we're all amply re, uh, uh, justified in rejecting Muhammad a prophet, especially if you believe in the Bible. Time's up. Thank you, Mr. Wood. We have time now. You have 15 minutes for your rebuttal. I did point out uh, that the Satanic Verses story is mentioned by Ibn Ishaq at Tabari. This is true, but why were they writing? You have to look at their intention. At Tabari actually wrote an introduction as to why he wrote. And he basically says in there that he took as many traditions as he could lay his hands upon without expressing an opinion about the reliability because these men are not scholars. This is how, this is how his history was recorded by the early Muslim historians. They took whatever information they could without, ju without, without uh, deeming a, 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 a judgment upon them because they didn't have the prerequisite knowledge. The Satanic Versus story is not taken seriously by any Muslim scholar of Hadith. It's not because they're embarrassed by it. No, it's because it's not reliable. It's not reliable at all. He said the original part of Surah Najm had this thing about the Satanic Versus. Where is that version of the Quran? Where is it? It's gone. And in the story itself it says, it says in the Satanic Versus story that uh, the people from Abyssinia started to come back into Mecca. That's what it says. This is historically inaccurate. The Muslims were living under sanctions at the time. This is a fact. Now I want to talk about the, the polygamy issue here, uh, uh, especially about the marriage with Aisha. Now you have to understand, when the Prophet was 25 years old, he married Khadija, who was a 40-year-old woman at the time. And he stayed married to her and her alone for the next 23 years until his death three or four years later. And then he married a series of 11 women uh, in his, when he was well into his 50s and all from different tribes. Now I ask you, is this an action of a lust addict or a master strategist? In the full bloom of his youth, he has one wife and she's 15 years older than he is. But in his old age, he has many wives. You see, they were all from different tribes. He was able to peacefully reconcile the entire Arabian Peninsula based on his marriages. They had a common relative now. There was a kinship between them. We need to take our minds out of the gutters. This is why he had more than four wives. You see, because he is a prophet, and the duty of a prophet is to take the message to the people. He's exceptional in many ways. He had to pray six times a day. He had to pray to Hajjah. That's only for him. Pray six, who wants to do another prayer? But he did it out of, raw, out of awe and reverence for his Lord. He was not allowed to receive charity. That's only for him. This only for thee and not the believers at large. He's exceptional in many ways. There's no lust motive here. Again, Mr. Wood is looking at things... With, uh, through his own kind of mentality of the Bible, because the Bible goes into these things and he looks at things at surface level, so on and so forth, you know, raiding the caravan, right? When did this happen? In the early, early Medinan period. Why? Because Abu Sufyan, who was in Mecca, he was taking the Muslim possessions in Mecca because the Muslims were kicked out of Mecca and the majority of their possessions were left in Mecca. So he was taking their possessions, going to Syria and trading with them over there. Their own possessions. And this was a time of war. This was a time of, this was, this, the, the Muslims were now allowed to physically defend themselves. This, these were their own possessions, right? Now, uh, as far as, uh, what else did he bring up here? Um, uh, so, okay, the marriage with Aisha. Now, in Semitic and Middle Eastern culture, even unto this day, you know, forget 1400 years ago. My own grandmother, 60 years ago in Iran, got married at 13 years old. In this culture, puberty is a sign of teenage rebellion. Right? Is this progression? In 1889, in this state, California, the legal age of consent was 10 years old. In Hawaii in 2001, it was 14. A man can go to Hawaii, marry a girl, right, a woman, and then cross the Pacific into California, and suddenly he's a pedophile. You see, American children today, one-third are obese, and they're addicted to television and internet pornography. Mr. Uh, Wood's uh, 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 argument is completely anachronistic. Aisha was given away by her parents to the prophet who married her lawfully and consummated the marriage after she began her menstrual cycle, a God-given natural sign of adulthood. And Mr. Wood likes to present Aisha like she's a secret. No one knows. My own daughter's name is Aisha. It's one of those popular Muslim names in the world. This was a saintly woman whose intellect and maturity cannot be found in the world today. You know, she's playing with dolls. No, it actually says that after she gave up playing with dolls, that's when she became an adult. So what is she was playing with dolls? My mother has a Beanie Baby collection. She's, she's the most... She's the most intelligent woman I know. I have baseball cards. I have a Barry Bonds rookie. He was a lot smaller back then. So what? 
What, 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 what's, what's with this woman? She was the only wife who had not been married before. This does not fit the psychological profile of a pedophile. Besides, uh, a, a girl or a person, who, a child who is sexually molested, they become very introvert and, and possibly self-destructive later on in their lives. Why well, is Aisha like this? Certainly not. Why did the prophet marry her? Because he knew as a prophet, several decades after his death, she would become an imminent teacher who expounded first-hand knowledge of the Prophet's life and example. Thousands of hadith come from her. Thousands of hadith. She was a genius. One time an Iranian Christian asked me, an Iranian Christian, why did, why did your Prophet marry a, such a young girl, a child bride? Right? I said, you know who else married a child bride? Joseph the carpenter. Joseph, we, we have to look at things equally, balanced. We can't say, oh, forget about what the Christians are saying. You know, let's just see what, let's just look at Islam for a minute here. No, read your own sources. How old was uh, Mary when she was impregnated by the Holy Ghost? Twelve years old. She was married to Joseph the carpenter at the time. I mean, look at the New Advent Encyclopedia, the commentary of the Oxford Dictionary Bible. Read the Proto-Gospel of James. Matthew says, before they came together, uh, uh, you know, before they came together, she was found impregnated by the Holy Ghost. Right? Before they came together to do what? Play Monopoly? Play with dolls? Before they came together sexually, she was found impregnated by the Holy Ghost. Why didn't Joseph consummate the marriage? Because she was still a child at the time. You have to wait till you reach puberty. But as soon as she did, the Annunciation of Christ came. Now Mr. Wood says in his online writings, what do you think of a prophet who has intercourse with a nine-year-old girl. This is an atheist argument. Mr. Wood is coming from the background of an atheist. This is not a Christian argument. Because an atheist would also say, what do you think of a God who decides to enter into the world through the birth canal of a 12-year-old virgin? Hmm, that sounds suspect. What kind of God is that? Why would he do that? Ugh, I don't know about that religion. If Mr. Wood is going to argue that the Holy Prophet Muhammad was immoral, then he has conceded that the Holy Spirit was immoral because he impregnated Mary at 12 years old. And I must remind Mr. Wood that according to his own Gospels, slander against the Holy Spirit is an unforgivable sin. Now, I, wanna, I wanted to go into the biblical criteria for prophethood, but Mr. Wood has brought up so many points here, I'm going to bypass that, get into some of uh, what he was saying here. You know, the, the Quranic scientific errors. The sun was setting in a pool of murky water, right? What does the verse actually say? Dul Qornain, the man with two horns. It doesn't mean the devil, right? If you look at ancient Macedonian coins, Alexander the Great's likeness is shown with two horns, his dominion over the east and the west. The, the town of Lycnus was annexed to Macedonia during his time. This was the extreme west of his empire. The verse says he saw the sun. He perceived the sun setting in a, in a pool of murky water, right? Now, in this town, to the west of the town, is a huge lake, 170 square miles, fed by underground springs through limestone rocks that issue extremely murky water. Right? Looking, at the, looking at the lake from the town, the observer would seem to see the sun setting in a pool of murky water. Right? But now, what does the Quran actually say, though? That was his perception, Alexander the Great, Dhul Qurnayn. The Quran says, Kullun fi falaki yasbahun, regarding the planets. All of the celestial bodies, kullun is in the plural, not in the duo, plural. It's, just, it's not just talking about the sun and the moon. Plural, all of the, the stars, the planets, all of them. Kullun fi falaki yasbahun. Falak means to coil or orbit. Yasbahun means uh, a, a, a motion from the, from the object in question. Swim is not a right a word. Revolve is the correct translation. According to Dr. Maurice Bukai, well, I have the book there, The Bible, the Quran, and Modern Science. This was a man who studied the Bible and the Quran objectively, and he converted to Islam in the process. He says the Quran doesn't make a single scientific blunder. What about the Bible? Does it make any scientific errors? It says in Genesis chapter 30 that Jacob took, took rods of striped wood and put it in a watering trough and had some, some animals look at them while they were mating. And then when their young was born, they had striped fur. In other words, whatever you're looking at when you're, during conception will determine the physical characteristics of your offspring. So if a man is having intercourse with his wife and he's watching Barney the Big Purple Dinosaur, <laughs> His son will be born purple and have a long tail. The Bible says that the earth is 5,768 years old. Look at the genealogy of Luke. He, he mentions all of the patriarchs from the creation of Adam all the way to Jesus. Add 2,007 years. You get 5,768 years. And this is what Christians believe for centuries. This is what they believed. And then they found dinosaur bones and they performed radiocarbon-14 dating on them. And how old are they? About 65 million years old. I, well, I think we forgot to, call, to, to carry the one over. I think that we put the decimal place. And there's actually a Christian uh, apologist like Jack T. Chick who will actually argue 
that dinosaurs and human beings once lived in perfect peace and harmony on the earth. That's not science. That's called the Flintstones. <laughs> now, um, he says, you can have you know, uh, uh, sex with captives. I want to quote you. Uh, um, let's see here. Okay. If you see a beautiful woman, I'm going to quote you a verse from scripture. If you see a beautiful woman amongst the captives, take her home and shave her head. After a month, you can have conjugal rights with her. That's what the verse says in Deuteronomy chapter 21. Again, this is Jesus, the old God of the Old Testament, is telling the Jews this law, but Mr. Wood finds fault in it. Why? Why does he find fault in it? Because, you know, it doesn't make sense to our new enlightened society. This was an ancient law. What he didn't mention, this was a biblical time. This was actually good for them. Men and women without men were sitting ducks for, marauder, for marauders and gangs. They were sitting ducks. And then he mentioned the story of Bani al-Mustalik. What he doesn't mention, what he didn't mention, however, is that when the prophet defeated them, he married, and all of these were defensive campaigns. He was constantly under attack in Medina. Constantly under attack. These were in, de in defense. Now, when he defeated them, he married uh, one of their women, Umm al-Mu'mineen Juwariya radiallahu anha. He asked for her father in marriage. His, he asked her father. And when the Sahaba, the companions, noticed that the Bani al-Mustaliq were now kin to the Prophet, over 100 families were released from captivity. This was an, a benevolent act on his part. A benevolent act. Um, now, Sharia does allow a man to have conjugal rights with his female captives if it is consensual. This is an ancient law. It ain't a biblical law. It has no application in the world today. You can't apply this today. This is an ancient law. Now, rape, however, is absolutely forbidden in any context. It's a capital offense. The Quran is very clear about that. Um, he also, uh, let's see, what else did he, what did he mention here? <clears throat> oh, the Jews, the killing of the Jews. Now, he's saying, you know, the, when the prophet went to Medina, uh, he took it personal because the Jews didn't accept his message, so he just started to kill them. If you, nothing is further from the truth. The first thing he did when he got to Medina, the very first act he did was sign a treaty, a peace treaty, with all of the Jews of the Oasis. They all signed the treaty, in which he stipulated, and I'll quote it to you, the Jews shall maintain their own religion and the Muslim theirs. Loyalty is a protection against treachery. All three Jewish tribes signed the treaty. All three Jewish tribes broke the treaty. The first two Jewish tribes were exiled north, the Khaybar. The, second Jewish, the third Jewish tribe, the Bani Qureda, they attempted several times to assassinate the Prophet and they broke their treaty. During the siege, when 10,000 people stormed the oasis, they broke their treaty with the Prophet. They were guilty of treason. They were guilty of treason. In times of martial law in the civilized world, if you commit treason, it, you'll, they'll kill you. So these men, only the men, and this is, this is interesting because the Prophet judged them according to their own law. Their own law says, quote, Deuteronomy 20, it states that a far-off city guilty of treason will have its men executed and women ch and, and children taken into captivity. But if the city is of these nations, save alive nothing that breathes. Deuteronomy chapter 20, revealed by Jesus Christ according to David Wood, the God of the Old Testament. Right? Now suddenly in the, in the New Testament he has a change of heart. Love your enemy, turn the other cheek, so on and so forth. So, you know, Marcion had a point about that. So according to their own, he judged them according to, the, according to their own law, they deserve total annihilation. But he judged, he judged them by the more merciful one. And the chief of the Bani Qureda, Ka'ab ibn Asad, he actually commented before he was uh, executed, you Muslims were just with us. You Muslims were just with us. I mean, Mr. Wood, again, is, is setting up a smoke screen. He's ignoring, he's ignoring the vast majority of the Prophet's uh, uh, existence in this world as a mercy unto all mankind. You know, 99% of what people have said about him, his enemies included, and he's concentrating on one little percent of, you know, some, some uh, uh, Jewish man said this, a hypocrite said that, so on and so forth. I mean, it's, it's not being balanced. Again, we have a, a breach of balance. Um, what else did he say? Oh, the star. Oh, uh, a star is a shooting, uh, uh, it's, it's aimed at a demon. How does Mr. Wood know this is not true? Can he see demons and angels? You know what it says in the book of Matthew? It says the Magi, these Zoroastrian priests from my country of Iran, they came into Bethlehem following a star. It was hovering over a, over a stable. You know how big a star is? How is this possible? But that's perfectly scientifically acceptable to Mr. Wood. But a, a shooting star after a demon? I can't accept that. A demon he can't even see. Unless he can see demons. I don't know. Um, 
But I'm running out of time here. And he said, uh, so, um, so we have to look at sound sources, right? We have to look at sound sources. Now, again, going back to the Satanic Verses story, there is something about Satanic Verses in Sahih Bukhari. It doesn't mention, however, that these verses were revealed. It just says, like he said, that the unbelievers, they, they made sajda, they prostrated at the end of the recitation because they were moved by the words of the Qur'an. It doesn't mention at all that he, he, was, uh, he made up these verses or he listened to Satan or anything like that. There's no details given in Sahih Bukhari. This is only in Ibn Ishaq, a historical source that came after these works like Kitab al uh, uh the Muwatta. I'm out of time, I'm sorry. Salaam alaikum. Thank you, Mr. Kai. Now, Mr. Wood will begin round three to pose a question to the Kai, and he'll have three minutes to respond to it. This will go on. Thank you, Mr. Kai. Now, Mr. Wood will begin round three to pose a question to the Kai, and he'll have three minutes to respond to it. This will go on for about a series of ten questions. Um. <clears throat> All right, Ali, uh, I have a quick question about um, methodology because uh, I think it relates tonight's debate to your debate with Mike Lacona. In your debate with Mike Lacona, Mike was trying to defend the resurrection and he immediately went to the earliest possible source material, um, which is found in 1 Corinthians, and he built his case based solely upon the earliest possible material that he could find, while well, you went to sources like the Gnostic Gospels, which are anywhere from 120 to 250 years after the material he was using, um, and tonight I've gone to our, to our earliest biography um, for information about Muhammad, and you're acting like I was, I'm just making a huge mistake, and, but I, I, I want to focus on, on something specific. You say that Muhammad... Uh, never raised his hand against a woman. Um, and that, that, that this shows that Muhammad um, was a... Well, th th this makes Muhammad good, but in, in Sahih Muslim, Aisha specifically says that Muhammad hit her in her chest and caused her pain. And I'm just wondering, as far as methodology goes, um, I see you sort of picking and choosing your sources rather than just going for what the sources say. And if a source like Sahih Muslim says um, that Muhammad hit Aisha in her chest, and you say Muhammad never raised his hand to a woman, who should I believe? Should I, be, should I believe Sahih Sitta and Aisha, or should I believe you? Uh, I'd have to see this alleged hadith. You'd have to quote it to me and show it to me. Um, I know of no such hadith. Uh, regarding uh, my methodology, if you recall my debate with uh, Mr. Lacona, I did quote extra uh, biblical material such as, you know, Nag Hammadi Library and so on and so forth. But according to many Christian scholars uh, and objective scholars, Dr. Bart Ehrman, Dr. Elaine Pagels, they say the Gospel of Thomas predates the Gospel of John, that the Gospel of John was written as a reaction to the Gospel of Thomas. Strike me on the chest. Okay, um, I'll, I'll deal with this in a minute here. Um, but I also quoted stuff from the Q source document, with Ma which Matthew and Luke had access to, right? And the Gospel in Galatia at the time. This is pre Pauline. This is before Paul's letters, right? Uh, now, regarding the other things he's re mentioned about the uh, uh, earliest source material, um, there's no, there are no pagan sources from the first century that even mention Jesus. There's one Jewish source that mentions Jesus from the first century. These are the earliest writings. Where are the earliest writings? The earliest writings were done by Jews. They were done by Jews. Um, and there's no Jewish Christian sources that are left. They've all been lost. They've been destroyed by Trinitarian Christians. Um, so regarding this hadith, uh, he struck me on the chest, which caused me pain. Uh, again, this is looking at this on a surface level. Was that his intention? Did he want to hurt his wife? Re what does she say about him? This is what she says in all six books of hadith. He never returned an evil for an evil. He was never unjust. This is what she says. Now he shows me a hadith where he was, he was struck, uh, struck her on the chest. One time, another time, during the Battle of Badr, the prophet, there was a man in the first line, and he, the prophet took an arrow and just jabbed him in the chest a little bit to move him back. And the man said, you hurt me. And the prophet said, that was not my intention. 
right? And the man said, I want my requital. So the prophet spread his chest and said, you can take it. And the man jumped and he leapt and he, he kissed the, the, the chest of the prophet. And he said, I just wanted to kiss you, right? We have to look at what was his intention. Our scholars have looked at all of these hadith. Just looking at something at the surface level, I can do the same thing with the Bible. I look at something at the surface level. I have come to bring a sword, right? Jesus, Matthew 10, 34. What's up with that sword? The Christian will say, no, 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 you stupid Muslim. This is an allegory. This is, this is uh, you know, he's symbolical. Just because it says sword, just because it says strike, doesn't mean strike. Our scholars have looked at these things in detail. They've looked at the Arabic. They've done cross-references with thousands of other hadith. They don't just say, okay, it says this, so therefore that's what it means. Right? So, uh, again, this is uh, Mr. Wood just looking at things at a superficial level, at a surface level, and drawing his own erroneous conclusions to them. I can do the very same thing to his sources as well. Thank you. Oh, you turn for a question. Oh, okay. Um, now, I did mention uh, um, <clears throat> now, the New Testament uh, clearly states that it is preferable for men to castrate themselves, become eunuchs, Matthew 19:12. It also states that true Christians can drink poison, Matthew, Mark chapter 16, and not be harmed. Finally, it states that women must pray with their heads covered, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, and that a woman speaking in church is shameful, 1 Corinthians chapter 14. My question is, why don't the vast majority of Christians follow these rules? And if they do, I would like, Mr. Wood, I have a, I have a vial of whiteout, liquid paper, highly toxic. I would like Mr. Wood to swig this bottle of whiteout. If he does not do it, then he does not agree that this is the word of God because he's a Christian and Jesus says, according to the gospel of Mark chapter 16, that he can drink poison and survive. If he does not do it, then he is admitting this is not the word of God. If he does, if he does do it and he survives, I am, I am willing to become a Christian tonight. Did you say a bottle of whiteout? I might do that for you. Um, what were the, what, uh, I, got, I wrote down poison and women in churches. What, there was something else. Um, Men uh, have to become eunuchs. It's preferable for men to become eunuchs. Christian to be poison. A woman must pray with her head covered, according to 1 Corinthians 11. A woman speaking in church is shameful, according to 1 Corinthians okay. 14. Um, <clears throat> uh, as far as the mark, that comes from uh, the end of Mark, which practically every scholar, uh, every Bible scholar in, in the world says was not authentic, um, that this was a later edition. And so that's not in the early source material as far as, our earliest, our earliest records don't have that part about the, uh, about the poison. Um, as far as the men becoming eunuchs, Jesus wasn't talking about physically castrating him, him themselves. Um, he didn't do that. This is, this, is a spiritual, this is a spiritual situation similar to what the Apostle Paul did, where you dedicate yourself wholly to God and you, you, you don't get married so that you can dedicate your entire life to God, and he doesn't, he doesn't command them to do this. He says, you know, those who can accept this should, and Jesus did this, and of course the Apostle Paul took this route, and I think that was, that was especially fitting during that time of, of persecution by the Romans. Um, why, why would someone go out and get married when you might get killed next year? And so there, there are reasons for these things, and, um, and even today I would say, look, if, 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 if you're a man and you don't need a woman, or you're, you're a woman and you don't need a man, and you want to dedicate your life only to God, that biblically, that, that is a good route. Um, as far as women in churches, um, I'd say there, there, there are several um, interpretations of this. One is, is uh, that, well, in Corinth, the only women who were allowed to speak in public gatherings were, were the temple prostitutes. Um, that's one possible. I'm not even saying that is, a, that is an interpretation. Um, another is that um, the men already knew that they had to keep quiet and that women were allowed to come in and be taught for the first time and that Paul lays this down, hey, you need, you, you need to be quiet too. Um, I'm not saying that's, that's the correct interpretation either, but I'd say, worst case scenario, Paul says, um, you're not speaking in church, and okay, that would, be a, that, would be, that would be something to think about, but the bottom line is there are other interpretations of these verses. So, oh, as far as, uh, I guess, my next question. Um, there's a war um, in Iraq. And lots of bad things have been done by, uh, by both sides. Um, and I'd ask a question uh, like this. Suppose tomorrow on the news we hear that American forces um, went into a village, 
They, they killed the men. They took the women captive. They had sex with, um, with their female captives before selling them into slavery. Um, and then they tortured a man for money. They, they found a man that, that had some money and they tortured him until he gave it to them. Um, I know that you don't believe that some of these stories are true, but, um, I mean, as far as uh, about uh, Muhammad, but I would say this, if you heard that story on the news, would you say that they were, uh, that American soldiers were wrong for doing of all, all of this? And if so, do you understand why I would be very bothered, why I'm very bothered when I go to the early Muslim sources and see these things? Oh, um, of course it would be bothersome. This is an invading army in Iraq. They're, they have invaded this country, and that's what they do. Now, again, uh, we have to see, uh, again, we have to be balanced again. Again, Mr. Wood has, has breached the, the rule of being balanced. What, does, what happens in the Bible? I mean, he acts like the Bible isn't the word of God. Why did the prophet send these campaigns out against these tribes anyway? They were planning on attacking Medina, and they did. Several, several times they attacked Medina. This was the law, this is the ancient law of the time. You see, women and children are not killed. Does Mr. Wood prefer that the women were killed, like the Bible says? And kill the children as well? Save alive nothing that breathes? Is that, is that a better law? You know? So, uh, again, this is just... This is just, you know, for shock. You know, he wants to shock you. This is a, a culture of shock. He has to add some, some flavor to things. You know, this is like the trick of the media. We have to shock people. What? This is what Islamic law says? Wow, that's amazing. Again, just a surface level of, of understanding. We just want to shock people. In the, in the, I can do the same thing. I'll do the very same thing. You know, Jesus says, you know, in Luke chapter 19, this is, this is when he's, in, he's at Bethany. This is the context. He's camped at Bethany with his disciples, preparing for his entrance into the holy city of Jerusalem to declare himself the king of the Jews, Hamashiach. He says, those enemies who do not accept me as their king, bring them hither and slay them before me. And then he reveals in the Old Testament to Moses that apostates, whether they're men, women, or children, they must be killed. Those who do not worship the Lord God of Israel must be murdered, both old and young, man and old. Now I'm going to ask, uh, this is not my question by the way, but I'm telling Mr. Wood now that doesn't that bother him from his own Bible? Doesn't it bother him? Could that be my question? No. Oh, sorry. Okay. <laughs> uh, now here's my question. <clears throat> oh, it's, it's actually similar. Uh, if Jesus is the God who inspired the Old Testament, why did he command Moses and Joshua to kill women and children? Why did he command that? And when is the killing of children morally justifiable? Well, uh, uh, I think that's a good question. I'm not sure I could answer it in three minutes. Uh, and nor can I say that this is the, the official Christian position. I'll say, I can say what we're dealing with, though. Um, as far as issues like this bothering me, I think you and I are different. You look at all of these issues I bring up and you, it's just a smoke screen. This is just ridiculous. This is, this is no objection at all. And I'm looking at it and going, whoa, this is wild. But I'm like that with the Bible too. I'm like that with the Bible. There, I will say right now, there are tons of things in the Bible that really, really bother me. And the difference is I think that Christianity can actually deal with these problems. I don't think that Islam can. And, and I, I think people have seen that tonight because you've had an opportunity to answer and you keep pointing the finger at Christianity. As far as Jesus being the God of the Old Testament, um, here's, here's, here's the data we have. One, lots of really bad things in the Old Testament. And then two, Jesus coming along and saying, you have heard that it was said eye for eye, tooth for tooth, Old Testament. But now I tell you, um, love your neighbor, turn your other cheek, things of, things of this nature. Um, pray for those who persecute you. So we see, yes, we do see a huge change, and the, the question is, uh, wh why this change? And I would say, and this is, this is, this is my personal theology, I think that um, human beings, um, I do need to fall here, uh, human beings have, are in rebellion against God, and I believe that God, uh, during the Old Testament, said something along these lines, um, if you'd like a world uh, where you can do what you want, that's your choice, but I have to be separate from you. And so God withdraws. God withdraws from humankind, um, not completely, I think that would kill us, but God withdraws, and then we have human beings um, sort of uh, not, not having God there to, to guide them in all things. And so we get the law, and I think that part of the point of the law, there are lots of uh, purposes of the law, I think part of that purpose um, is to show do you really want to live this way apart from God and just be living by law? 
um, these very harsh laws. Um, I think part of that was to, was to show us you don't want to live like this. And now what do we have? With the incarnation, we have Jesus returning to the world, God coming back to live among us, and then saying, look, now you see a different way. Now you see what life is like when I am among you. And he heals everyone. And he preaches peace. And saying, this is how life, this is how life should be. And so, uh, well, I mean, the bottom line, whether, whether that view is, is correct or not, Christianity and Islam aren't in the same boat here. Our greatest revelation said, turn the other cheek. Um, our greatest revelation never had any slaves, um, didn't have multiple wives, um, didn't have a nine-year-old wife, um, and this goes for Jesus and, and, and people like Paul. It, it was, it's a completely different picture, and so going to the Old Testament, um, it's, uh, it's just not the best approach with a Christian because if you say, hey, look at the Old Testament, isn't that wrong? Jesus said that was wrong. Don't live like that. That's what Jesus said. Um, as far as my question, um, <clears throat> this would relate to, to some of the things I just said about, about uh, I think that we are somewhat different in that I see, I, again, I see lots of things in the Bible as, as great difficulties, but I think that Christianity um, is not in the same position and that Christianity can deal with these issues. Um, and I like, to, I like to ask a question. Um, I, go to the, I go to the sources, and if you don't want Ibn Asak, Ibn Asak's out. Um, we can, go, we can go anywhere. We can go Al Bukhari, uh, Sahih Muslim, any of these sources. And wherever you go, I find things that really, really bother me, um, you know, especially spiritual issues and violence issues and things of that nature, Aisha. And I look, and these things really bother me, um, but they don't bother you. And some of these seem extremely relevant, and you're saying, no, it's a smoke screen, it's a smoke screen. And I would just ask, what would a prophet have to do before you would be willing to question whether he's the greatest moral example ever? In your, in your, in your statement, you're saying, Muhammad only killed 1,500 people. What's that? Um, I mean, if he killed a million, would that make a difference? I mean, what, what's, what, are the, what are the numbers here? What would Muhammad have, what would the early sources have to say before you'd, will, you'd be willing to say, wow, maybe this guy isn't the greatest moral example for all mankind for all time? It would say something to the effect of, go into any city and slaughter their women and children, just like the Bible says. By the standards of the Bible, I can't accept that Moses was a prophet then. I do not believe a prophet would kill women and children. Never. Now, Mr. Wood completely ignored my question. He's saying that's what the Old Testament said, and then we have Jesus coming. That was Jesus, according to Orthodox, Christian orthodoxy, unless he's a Marcionite. Maybe he's a Marcionite. Maybe he believes that God is a different God. That was Jesus telling the Israelites. He commands them. It's very clear. Atta arise and attack the Midianites. Kill their women, only the young girls for yourselves. This is, this, and this is, according to the Talmud, this is how the Jews took that inspiration from Jesus to rape three-year-old girls. And there's no reproach in the Bible about what they, God does. Well, no, that's not what I meant. You know, so he has a lot of sophistry. You know, he's a philosopher, so he's, he's dancing around the issue. Now, Muhammad killed 1,500 people. This was in defense. These were in wars. These were in wars. He didn't go out and kill him, you, you, no, 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 no. People are attacking him and he sends, he sends armies against them because they're attacking him. What happened? He was always outnumbered. The Battle of Badr, three, three to one odds. Battle of Uhud, four to one odds. He's defending his community now. Now he's in a position of power to defend, you see. Now as far as, uh, um, you know, advocating slavery, what does Jesus say about that, you know, in the New Testament? What does he say about that? Now, first of all, it should be noted that the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he reformed this. He actually said in sound hadith that uh, uh, your slaves are your brethren. Feed and clothe them like you do your own brothers. And then he eventually abolishes. And he said, whoever frees a slave, God will free from paradise. What does Jesus say in Luke 12, 47? He says, the, the servant who disobeys his master's will flog him many times with many lashes. Right? Now, look at the Prophet's family. His adopted son, Zayd ibn Haditha, he was described as having a flat nose and dark skin. He is called Hibbu Rasulillah, the beloved of the Messenger of God. He was a black man. The first man to do the Adhan, they called the prayer, Bilal ibn Rabah, handpicked by the Prophet himself, a former Abyssinian slave that the Prophet exalted on top of the Kaaba to make the call to prayer. This was a black man. And this, at, time, at the time, to the Quraysh was like, what's this man doing? This is our slave. What is he doing on top of the house of God? Right? And then after the Prophet's mother died, the woman who took care of him, her name was Barakah bin Tha'laba, also known as Umm Ayman. She was a woman of Abyssinian descent. She was a black woman. The Prophet said, she is like my mother after my mother. 
a black woman. So the, the woman he considered to be his mother, black woman. The first man to do the Adhan he appointed, black man. His adopted son, called the beloved of the messenger of God, described as a black man. What does the Bible say about these, about these issues? The Prophet says, Kullukum in Adam wa Adam in Turab. All of you are from Adam, and Adam is from dust. Um, Peter says, slaves must be submissive to their masters, even in fear and trembling, even if they're harsh. The Bible did nothing to, re, to, re, to, uh, to help this problem in the world of slavery. I'm, done, I'm out of time. Uh, I guess it's time for me to ask a question. Um, <clears throat> okay. Uh, okay, given the fact that the proto-Orthodox church, now we're going to switch some gears here, get away from the violence issue that Mr. Wood likes to talk about a lot. Uh, the proto-Orthodox church fathers place such a high emphasis on the fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy. Read the Gospel of Matthew, he quotes the Septuagint, he misapplies prophecies, he misquotes the Septuagint. Um, and given the fact that I mentioned two prophecies that mention the prophet by name, they mention him, and this is just a, a fraction of the prophecies, they mention him by name. You say, oh, you know, George Bush is prophesied in the Bible as well, if his name is Bush. Now, <clears throat> where is Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, right? Now, I believe Jesus was the Messiah and he's a prophet. But my question is very specific. Where does it say in the Old Testament that Jesus Christ will be the Jewish Messiah? Where does it say his name will be Jesus? Where does it say that? I can show you a verse in the Bible that calls the beloved of God Muhammad, Himda, Ahmad. But Mr. Wood, I don't think he can show us a verse that says the name of the Jewish Messiah is Jesus. Yet he rides a donkey into Jerusalem and he's the Messiah. It doesn't, it's, it's not good evidence. Um, well, I'll say you, you can't invent your own criteria of, of what makes a true prophet. You can't say, well, if there's a word in the Old Testament that sort of looks like Muhammad, and you know that this word is used in many places in the Old Testament, and that it, and that it never means Muhammad, and that most of the places, you, you, if you try to put Muhammad in there, it would make no sense at all, and yet you do it. Um, but besides this, I would say I, I've, ar I've already refuted the entire biblical case. Um, in Deuteronomy it says, if a prophet says something that God has not revealed, or two, Says, speaks in the name of other gods, un ever, he cannot under any circumstances be a prophet. And I offered eight sources um, showing that Muhammad did both um, and confirmed. In al-Bukhari, you said, <laughs> your response to the verse in al-Bukhari where, where, uh, where the polytheists all bow down in honor of this revelation was that, well, maybe they just really like this verse. The way it stands in the Quran now, it condemned all of their gods and, and that just doesn't make any sense. Um, God condemned all their gods and these people bowed down. Um, why in the world would they do that? But if we, put this, if we put this in context with all the other passages, it's pretty clear. It fits perfectly. They bowed down in honor of the satanic verses because their gods were affirmed by Muhammad. And if that's the case, I don't care if you can go to Song of Solomon, which, by the way, uh, most Muslims I talk to think that Song of Solomon is, is not inspired and that it's a gross book because it's about sex. You go against the grain and say, no, right in the middle of this book that's about a sexual relationship between a husband and a wife, there's this word that looks like Muhammad. I'm going to ignore all the other places where this word occurs and pretend that right here, this is a clear prophecy about Muhammad. And I just don't think that this is a good argument at all. Um, as far as, uh, I'll just return to slavery since, since that was my answer. Uh, you talked about slavery. You said Muhammad was, was, was great and that he wasn't a racist. Um, let's not forget, Muhammad enslaved thousands of people, and I can give you the references. Uh, read the sources. We find Muhammad trading female slaves for weapons, and we know this from the sources that Muhammad had black slaves. I've got the reference right here. Um, I've got, I got a reference where he traded two black slaves for another slave. Um, but you try to show that Christianity is the real oppressor and that Muhammad was the real liberator. And I just want to say, everyone, don't, let's not, be careful when, when you listen to words because um, think about it, Muhammad traded slaves. He captured people and made them slaves. And Jesus never had any slaves. Paul never had any slaves. It was, it was eventually Wilberforce, a Christian, who, who, who ended the, the slave trade. And Ali sort of shifts it right around and Islam, which Muhammad, you know, bought and sold slaves his entire life, uh, that's the good one. And Christianity, no, pro-slavery. I'm oh, sorry. A oh, question? 
Um, <clears throat> Ali, you seem to be against violence for the most part, um, you know, unless it's a just war or something like that, I, I think. Um, and I commend, I commend you for that. Now, um, in 1988, Salman Rushdie's book, The Satanic Verses, um, came out, and there was a call for Rushdie's death. The Japanese translator was killed. Um, several other people were killed, um, translators and so on, um, or injured. And right here in California, two bookstores were firebombed for selling the book. And what I'd like to ask is, would you be willing to say um, to all these people that, uh, that you don't believe this is the appropriate path and that it is morally wrong, it is morally wrong to react violently if Muhammad is criticized? Absolutely, yes, it is morally wrong. Uh, you know, it's, it doesn't make... It doesn't make any sense, you know, that I agree with Mr. Wood, the Muslim reaction, like to the cartoon thing, you know, I'm going to prove my prophet's not a terrorist by breaking a window, I mean, that's, that's counterintuitive, it doesn't actually work like that. Now, I wanted to, uh, again, say that, you know, Mr. Wood did not answer my last question, I asked for a prophecy of Jesus by name, and he kind of danced around the issue, and then he said, well, Song of Solomon is about sex and this and that, well, Christians say that Isaiah chapter 7 is about Emmanuel, was the name of Jesus Emmanuel? No, it was Jesus. And if you read chapter 8, it says that Emmanuel was born to King Ahaz. So, what's up with that? He was already born. The Christian says, well, there are multiple levels of prophecy. That's what Origen believed. There are multiple levels of, 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 of prophecy to texts. And this is an apparent context of the birth of the Jewish Messiah. Exactly. So, uh, I don't understand. Uh, it doesn't look like Mr. Wood is in, in, in agreement with his scholars. Uh, now, he says that only in this verse, it said that the word Muhammadim is in other places in the Bible. It does not occur in any other verse in the Bible. In the same form. I'll give you the verses. First Kings 20, 16, 26, it says Mahmad. And then another place, it says Muhammadiyya, Muhammaday Nuha, Muhammadiyya, Muhammadem, Muhammaday, Mahmad, Mahmad, Muhammaday. Only in 516 of Song of Songs, it says Muhammad Im. Im is a plural of respect in Hebrew. It says the beloved is Muhammad Im, like Elohim. It means literally gods. Christians believe that this is uh, a proof text of the Trinity, but they don't understand Semitic languages, that this is a, a plural of respect. A plural of respect. Now the only time, the only instance cited by Mr. Wood of a poet being killed for, uh, by, that is supported by sound narrations was Ka'ab ibn Ashraf. But what did he do? After the battle of Badr, he went to the Meccans in Quraysh and he urged them to raise an invincible army against the Prophet. Right? And then he came back to Medina and he wrote satirical poetry of the Prophet and the Companions and urged the Awlad Qayla, the Aus and the Khazraj, the two tribes that were in Medina before the migration of the Prophet, who had fought three previous civil wars, to kill the Prophet. This is what he wrote. Kill the Prophet. Stand up for yourselves and kill this man. This man was no, he was no victim. This man was an anarchist. This guy was a scoundrel. If I right now, go to Iraq right now, and I incite citizens of Iraq, kill any American on sight, what do you think would happen to me when I got to a back, back to America? One-way plane ticket to Gitmo Bay, where electric shock therapy and anal probings await me. <laughs> That's a fact. So, you have to understand, poetry was a very powerful media. Remember, it was a man on the radio urging the Hutus to slaughter the Tutsis during the Burundi Civil War. Over 300,000 people were killed with, because of that. It was a man on the radio, read your testimonials. They would write poetry urging the Jews and the pagans, would write poetry urging these Arabs to kill each other and kill the prophet and anarchy and this and that. This had to do with the society. They didn't just slander the prophet. One time a woman, uh, she poisoned the prophet, a Jewish woman, and he forgave her. Injuries against himself he would forgive, but when it had to do with the state, he had to be just. This is his state. This is his, his, his city. Okay, I'm done. Uh, question. <clears throat> okay, um, according to the Torah, <clears throat> which Mr. Wood believes is inspired by Jesus Christ, false prophets say things that do not come to pass, right? And they can be hanged on trees. Deuteronomy 18 and chapter 21. According to the Synoptic Gospels, Jesus said that the second coming would occur in his lifetime. There are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the, second come, until they see the Son of Man coming in great power. The present generation will live to see it all. These prophecies did not materialize. Now I want to preface this by saying I believe Jesus was a true prophet. I'm looking at biblical criteria. This never happened. Christians also believe that Jesus was hanged on a tree. So, doesn't this make him a false prophet by biblical standards? If not, why not? 
Um, the verse in the Old Testament is, is, says, cursed is every man who hangs on a tree. So if, you hang on a, if, you're, if you're hanged on a tree, you are, you are cursed. But that's, that's Christian theology. That's, we, we believe that. We believe that Jesus took the curse for us. And it, it, it goes like this, um, which is a problem, I think, which is a problem as, uh, as a philosopher that I find with Islam. In Christianity, we believe that God is infinite in all of his attributes. Um, God can't just let sin go at the end of time. Because if God, as you, as you believe, God will just forgive a bunch of sin at the end of time, that would mean that there is a bunch of sin that is not punished. And that would not be infinitely just, and therefore God would not be infinite in his attributes. As far as Christianity is concerned, we believe that, um, that Jesus Christ was cursed for, for sins that God would forgive people of. In other words, uh, at the end of time, you'll either take the price for your own sins or you'll be forgiven. If you're forgiven, your sins were placed upon Jesus Christ. And so God remains infinitely just, but also infinitely merciful because he came and sacrificed himself for our sins. And so we believe that, that Jesus was, uh, was under the curse um, of sin, not because of what he did, but because of what we did. Um, as far as the kingdom of God coming, there, there are, there are some, some various interpretations of this. Uh, one is, uh, well, they, they saw Jesus at the transfiguration, and they saw Jesus, uh, a couple of the apostles, saw Jesus in all his glory. And so they saw him um, in his kingdom. Another, another interpretation would be that when the Holy Spirit came at Pentecost, this was the kingdom of God coming. Um, and, and, there, and there are some others, but uh, I, don't, I don't think this, this would be a, a tremendous problem. And well, besides all that, we're here to talk about Muhammad. Did you have any questions about Muhammad? Oh. <laughs> um. Oh. What? Um, as far as, uh, I, guess I, I guess I'll ask a last question. Oh, you said, you, you were talking about Cobb and he was this horrible person. Uh, let me quote Abu Afak. This is what Abu Afak, according to our earliest biography of Muhammad, this is what he was killed for. This is justice. He wrote a poem saying this. Long have I lived, but never have I seen an assembly or collection of people more faithful to their undertaking and their allies when called upon than the sons of Kayla when they assembled, men who overthrew mountains and never submitted, a rider who came to them, split them in two, saying, permitted, forbidden, of all sorts of things. Had you believed in glory or kingship, you would have followed Tuba. The man was over a hundred years old and was stabbed to death for writing that poem. He basically says you would be better off following someone other than Muhammad. Um, and he was killed in his sleep for that. And I'm not sure that that, that qualifies as justice. You, you, I know you deny the story, but it, wow, all the details that are included. Ibn Ishaq seems like a, a, a great historian to me. I guess I'll, I'll ask one last question. The, uh, the spell on Muhammad, I just thought I'd ask you what you thought of that. I'm sure you'll have some things to say about Christianity in the process, but uh, what do you think about the spell on Muhammad? <clears throat> uh, that's a good question. Um, I want to first say that uh, Mr. Wood des described you know, the concept of justice you know, in Christianity, that, that God takes an innocent man and, and puts all of our sins upon him and then, and, then, and then flogs him until his bowels are laid open and then uh, sends him to hell after crucifying him between two thieves. That's not just. That's murder. That's called murder. These, oh, this entire concept of vicarious atonement compromises God's mercy and justice and omnipotence. He can't forgive sin. Why not? He's God. Who makes the rules? God. He has to come down in the form of a man. The, the Torah says, Lo ish el vichazev uven Adam. God is not a man. Christianity is in breach of this concept of uh, uh, this uh, uh, theological concept of the Old Testament. Therefore, it's a different religion, it's a different theology. Um, now, regarding the magic spell, we have to understand, the prophet was a human being. He was a human being. Okay? Now, Paul says in 2 Corinthians 12, 7, that a messenger of Satan comes and beats him over the head from time to time. 2 Corinthians 12, 7. When I bring this up to Christians, they said, uh, uh, I say, what's up with that? They say, you have to understand, he's a human being. He's an apostle. Right? Now, uh, a Jewish man of Bani Nadir, he did put a spell on the prophet. You know, he took a lock of his hair, so on and so forth. It did not affect his judgment. 
It did not affect the judge. It played with his memory a little bit. And then he prayed to God, and it was gone. And I already quoted that Jesus was lured by Satan. Jesus himself was God, which is a, a contradiction in the Bible. James says that God cannot be tempted with evil. Neither tempted he any man. But Abraham was tempted in Genesis 22. Jesus was tempted, who's, who's God in the flesh, according to Christians. So you have major contradictions here, and people don't want to deal with it. He doesn't want to deal with what Christianity says, because it's extremely troublesome for a lot of Christian apologists, these types of things. Again, double standards left and right. Um, I mentioned earlier that the Pharisees, uh, well, when, you know, the demon, regarding the demon possession, that the Pharisees, they said about Jesus, he is mad and has a demon. This is what the scholars of his day surmised about Jesus. Now, we don't know how Jesus felt about himself, because we don't have the privilege of looking at uh, uh, you know, sources from his original disciples. We have these four Gospels that are written in Greek at the end of the first century by anonymous people that never identify themselves and never claim to be writing while inspired by the Holy Ghost. And these are the four Gospels of, 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 the, of, of Matthew and Mark and Luke and John. No reputable scholar today believes this. These books are pseudonymous. They're forgeries. They're forged. How did Jesus really feel about himself? We don't have that information because we have very little... Uh, sources regarding Christianity. But we have everything said about the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. It doesn't like Ibn Ishaq, right? Ibn Ishaq is a, is a real good scholar. No. He, he, that's not what he says. The vast majority of Muslim scholars do not believe that he is reliable in many places. That's our scholarship. And it's not because we're embarrassed by it. There it is. You can read it. You can read everything. But Mr. Wood says he's a great scholar. I guess Mr. Wood has more understanding than 1,400 years of Islamic uh, scholarship. I guess, I guess he's receiving divine revelation from the Holy Ghost or someone. Uh, I'm out of time. Um, okay. My last question. <clears throat> In your article on your website called Murdered by Muhammad, God forbid, uh, you did not cite the books of Hadith. I'm not looking for Sirah. I'm not looking for At-Tabari and... Ibn Ishaq and Ibn Hisham and Ibn, uh, Ibn Sa'ad, I'm looking for books of hadith, canonized books of hadith, for the stories of Uqba ibn Abi Mu'ayt, Ibn Sunayna, Abu Afaq, Mirba ibn Qaisi, Asma bint Marwan, or the singing girls of Ibn Khattal. Where are these hadith, sir? If there's no hadith, then I don't know what to say. Well, as you know, the, the hadith are focused on um, Muhammad's teachings, and Muhammad ordering someone to go get, you know, his followers to go kill someone, Th that's, not, that's, that's not a lot about his teachings. Uh, what we find in Ibn Ishaq is that he's actually trying to put together a narrative of the life of Muhammad. And so he includes um, all kinds of details that, that wouldn't, be, wouldn't be included in, um, in a book which is just trying to gather together um, a number of sources without organizing them into a detailed biography. Um, as far as its reliability, I mean, think about what, what, the, what the great Oxford scholar Guillaume said. He said that the, the, the Surah Rasulullah um, contains practically everything that can be known about the life of Muhammad. Um, ton, tons of non-Muslim scholars go to this. Now, you, you know why this, I'll go ahead and say why Ibn Ishaq fell out of favor with Muslims. Ibn Ishaq favored Ali in the split, in the leadership split. He favored Ali. It wasn't because he did bad history. It wasn't because people thought he was unreliable. It's because he favored one leader over the majority and people discredited him from that time on. It doesn't matter uh, to me. I don't care about um, these disputes. I'm looking for what's our, what our earliest source is. That's, that's just what I think is the best method. If Ali can give me a good reason to reject this material, then fine, give me a good reason and I'll reject it. But until you give me a good reason, I'm going with the earliest material. And when I go with the earliest material, that's Ibn Ishaq. And when we go to Ibn Ishaq, we find assassinations, we find satanic verses, we find uh, lots, of, lots of important details. But even if you want to throw Ibn Ishaq out, I mean, you still have Muhammad in your most trusted collections, burning people's eyes out, um, cutting people's arms and legs off. Uh, you still have um, tons of instances of, of, of the women being um, well, Muhammad taking female captives. You pointed out the, uh, the Banala Mustalik. You said that, uh, that Muhammad took a wife from, from among them. That, that's true. Um, but I mean, think about it. You said, no, the sex was only consensual. It's only if they wanted it. Think about it. These women's families had just been annihilated. Do you think anyone there wanted to have sex, especially considering they were about to be sold into slavery? Um, I, I would say no. And so if we're... Uh, 
Well, it, put it this way. I look at your earliest sources, and we're, we're talking, we're talking al-Bukhari multiple times. We're talking uh, Sahih Muslim multiple times that report these stories, that report the stories of Muhammad allowing his followers to have sex with these female captives whose families had just been annihilated. It says it over and over and over again, and you say, no, never happened. Muhammad married a woman, and it was all peace and love. And that's just not what history tells us. Thank you, gentlemen. I'd like to now invite Mr. Kona. It's my bad. I'm Mr. Kona from last time. <laughs> Mr. David Wood to come up the stage and deliver his closing statement. You have five minutes, sir. <coughs> Um, <clears throat> Ali says that, that I like to shock people and that I do this stuff for shock value. Um, I don't think that's the case. I think this material is just shocking. And especially when, when Muslims go around, you know, Muhammad was a man of peace, he was always gentle. And then we go to the earliest sources, whatever they are, Ibn Ishaq, al-Bukhari, any of them, and we find lots of, lots of material that just doesn't line up with that. I'll respond to a couple issues um, here before I close. Um, Ali argues that the Jews what they got, got what they deserved um, when Muhammad uh, ran two of the tribes out of town and killed the third tribe, um, the males. Uh, he says they broke the treaty. Uh, I, I, I have to defend the Jews on this one because this is a, think about this. Medina was in constant warfare. They were sick of it. They were sick of fighting. Muhammad was called in as a peacemaker. He was called to bring peace, to end the fighting. And what did Muhammad do? He got there, yes, I'm going to bring peace. And he immediately starts picking a fight with Mecca. He starts robbing their caravans. Now think about it. Muhammad moved 180 miles north. He was free of Mecca. He didn't have to have any dealings with Mecca ever again. He had a chance for a new life. And what does he do? He starts robbing their caravans. Why? Because they persecuted him, because they weren't letting him go to the Kaaba. Now, uh, that, I mean, if, I'm, I'm sure you consider that a, 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 an important and a very important event. But think about it. If you're one of the Jewish tribes in Medina, you bring Muhammad in as a peacemaker, and he starts picking a fight with Mecca, the last people in the world you want to fight. And the first tribe backed out of the deal. That's true. Uh, but Muhammad didn't live up to his end of the bargain. He came to bring peace and brought them war. So they backed out, and they were kicked out of town, uh, all their belongings taken. Uh, the second group actually didn't do anything. Uh, Muhammad got a revelation saying they were after him, and they had thrown him a feast, and he said, no, they're, they're actually trying to get me. Now, if you're the third tribe of Jews, what are you thinking? First tribe, gone. Second tribe, gone. Uh, what are you thinking? You're thinking, we're next. And, uh, and Muhammad came in, and they, uh, they had the battle. And the Jews never actually fought, but they did try to form an alliance against Muhammad. And Muhammad had a chance to show that he was merciful, to show that he was uh, the merciful man that Muslims claim him to be. And every male who had reached the age of puberty was beheaded. The women and children sold into slavery. And read your records, the most beautiful woman was taken to Muhammad. Uh, that's, that's what we read in the early sources. And I'll just confess, if, if I were one of those, if I were that last Jewish tribe and I saw what was going on, um, I probably would, would try to defend myself too. Um, Ali, I didn't get a chance to respond. He said Aisha had reached puberty, and as long as a woman reaches, as long as a girl reaches puberty, um, it's okay. I would simply refer you um, to Sahih al Bukhari, volume 7, number 163, and volume 8 number 151, both of which specifically say that Aisha had not reached puberty. It says that this was the reason she was allowed to continue playing with dolls. So uh, if Ali says it's okay for a man to have sex with a nine-year-old girl as long as she's reached puberty, these sources just condemn Muhammad because he apparently had sex with her without, uh, before she reached puberty. Um, Ali said uh, he agreed that it is wrong to react violently um, if Muhammad is criticized. Now here, here's another problem. He says that it's wrong to react violently if Muhammad is criticized. When I go to the earliest source material, Muhammad reacted violently when he was criticized. 
People were killed. People were trampled to death um, for criticizing Muhammad. People who insulted him in Mecca were killed uh, years later. And so Ali says, yes, this is, this, is, this is awful behavior. You should not react violently. And then I go to the earliest sources, and I find that Muhammad himself so I, at reacted violently. And I would say then that according to Ali's own words tonight, the Muhammad we read about in the earliest sources stands condemned. Now, if the earliest sources had it wrong, then maybe we can, uh, maybe we can do something else. But as far as the earliest material as it stands now, um, again, Ali's own words, both with Aisha and with, uh, with violence, with reacting violently, uh, Muhammad uh, cannot be a prophet. And that's, that's ignoring uh, all of the other problems. And so um, I, haven't argued, I haven't argued for Christianity tonight, but uh, uh, I'd say that Christianity definitely has some issues to deal with, but I think Christianity can deal with the issues. That would be a different debate. But I think we've seen tonight that Islam cannot answer these questions, not without just pointing the finger at Christianity and saying, Christianity, Christianity. Mr. Wood, your time is up. Thank you. Thank you. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Uh, Mr. Wood likes to uh, add his own uh, twist on certain event, uh, events from the Prophet's biography. Uh, the most beautiful girl of the Jews. Uh, if he actually read the sources, uh, this woman is Safiha. Uh, her, her father was the, uh, the, the, the chief of the Jews. She had a dream two nights before of the moon coming and landing on her lap. And she told her father that this is a, a, a dream I'm having of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, coming to this city. And, he, and she was beat up for that by her father. He said, no, you're doing this and that. And he, and he beat her up and he abused her, almost killed her. Right? So she sought asylum with the Prophet. She sought the asylum. He didn't go out over him and choose you and you and you. No, there's nothing like that found in our sources. He doesn't, Mr. Wood is not looking at the sources correctly. Um, and he, he said he tried to pick a fight with the Meccans. He didn't pick a fight. He was under attack. They attacked. He was outnumbered in every battle. They had to dig a ditch around the city to keep them out. This is, his, this is historical fact. He was under attack. He didn't pick a fight with anyone. The Jews were well aware of this situation. And they signed the treaty. Why didn't why did, why, why did you say we're not going to sign the treaty? That's the first thing he did when he got to Medina. Now they're saying, oh, okay, the Quran is possibly in the Hadith or anti-Semitic or this and that. Have you ever read what the New Testament says about Jews? What Paul says? 1 Corinthians? They're Christ killers. They please not God. They're contrary to all men. Jesus says in the book of Revelation, they're the synagogue of Satan. The synagogue of Satan. Hmm. Then you have this, you know, judeo christian It's a big oxymoron. Judeo-Christianity. They're just, they're just using each other, right? It's just a big oxymoron. We're using you for your evangelical dollars so we can bankroll our apartheid state of Israel. And we're going to use you so we can, you know, bring about these convoluted prophecies of the book of Revelation of seven beasts with seven eyes, with seven horns, with seven legs, so on and so forth. That has to be, you know, the temple, so on and so forth. Interesting. Uh, so don't believe the hype. Don't believe the hype. I have a book here. This is by a, a, a Muslim scholar who recently passed. His name is Martin Lings. He converted to Islam. He studied all of the early sources of Islam. All of the early sources. All these early sirahs, Ibn Hisham, At-Tabari, Ibn Ishaq. And he wrote this book, taking the most authentic of those traditions, the most authentic, that had chains of narration, right? Ibn Ishaq Sira is very, very relatively minuscule when compared to the overwhelming hadith literature. It's minuscule. You think Ibn Hasak mentioned every single... No, he doesn't. Not in the least. It's minuscule, you see. The hadith, our sources are Quran and hadith. They're not Quran, Hadith, and Ibn, His, uh, Ibn His, His, Ishaq's Sirah of the Prophet. No, those are not our sources. Our sources are Quran and Hadith. These are our sources. Um, so, you have to understand that there are many powerful people in the world who directly benefit from the denigration of Islam and its Prophet. So, I have actually uh, a list here, and I'm going to leave them up here for you. These are, these are resources to help you uh, discover the truth about the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him. And this book here is, is on, that, on that list. Uh, so, um, you know, you want to become a millionaire overnight? You know how you can do that? You can either start your own church, or you can pretend to be a Muslim apostate and write a book about your experiences. People are out for money. That's all it is. It's all out for money. Um, so, we look, at the, look at this man's life. He was orphaned at six years old. He buried six of his own children, right? He, uh, he lost his wife of 23 years. He was constantly under attack. He's trying to survive. Read 
I've listed on this, on this uh, list here books by Karen Armstrong. She's a non-Muslim. Read what she says about the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him. And don't believe the hype. Turn off CBN and Fox News and, you know, these, these con men on TV. You know, uh, you have uh, uh, Pat Robertson and his magic milkshake. I can leg press 2,000 pounds. Okay. Uh, you know, Jimmy Swaggart and Ted Haggart. You know, people like this who, who uh, you know, Ibn Ishaq says this and that. Well, what does a Muslim scholar say about that? Why are you ignoring 1,400 years of Muslim scholarship? I'll grant you the Bible. Okay, this is your source. Let's look at the Bible. But Mr. Wood is saying, no, 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 forget about these hadith and, you know, this, these came later in the Quran. Okay, whatever. Let's look at this Ibn Ishaq biography and look at all these stories in here. This is not how research is done. This is a smokescreen. That's what it is. Let's look at the Bible, let's look at the Quran, look at the sound hadith. He doesn't want to do that. He wants to look at this Ibn Ishaq. And by the way, the Prophet, peace be upon him, did wait until Aisha had reached puberty. It's in all of our sources. I have no idea what Mr. Wood is talking about here. About he didn't, he waited. It says playing with dolls, but it didn't say he consummated the marriage. It didn't say he consummated the marriage. Nowhere does it say that before she reached puberty, he, he, he consummated the marriage. It says, you know, he tried to throw that in as his last word to, you know, take that one home with you, yeah, right? So don't believe the hype. People are intelligent, use your mind. We're not stupid people. Muslims are not, we're not idiots. We're not just following this man blindly because, oh, he do, forget about this and that. No, there's 1.2 billion Muslims. It's the largest denomination in the world. It's more than any Christian denomination because the Catholics and Christians are two different religions. Sorry, your time is up. Sorry. Well, that pretty much concludes our debate for tonight. Uh, thanks a lot for joining us. Thanks a lot for being so disciplined and patient today. I'd like to once again thank our two speakers, Mr. David Wood and Ali Tai, for joining us. Thank you. Have a good night.